Welcome to the If I Knew You Better podcast. My name is Brendan Davis, and I appreciate you being here with me today. I'm coming to you from my temporary home, for how long we don't quite know yet, here in Los Angeles. And I'm really happy today to be speaking to one of my very best friends and longtime business partner in different capacities. We've traveled a lot of roads and have any more to travel. Chris Sanders, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me on, Brendan. It's it's a ra- it's a rainy day in LA, so it's a good time to have a chat. Absolutely, absolutely. And so you are in beautiful Culver City, which uh, I like very much. Your neighborhood's very nice. We're going to talk about a few things before we start to get into the super deep details, though. Just give us a little bit of a sort of a short ish bio, kind of who are you, what do you do, where are you from, those sorts of things. My name is Christopher Randolph Sanders. In full. I grew up in Austin, Texas. I came to L.A. in the summer of 99, uh, kind of via London, and I've been sort of immersed in various communities here in Los Angeles uh, for that whole time. I would say I have a foot in in the spiritual and the uh, entertainment communities and all the sort of things that revolve around those. And, and, And Los Angeles has been a great place for all of that. Yeah, what, what we're going to get into your your coming to LA story. Um, I'll I'll mention a quick note here. Also, I have this other podcast, uh, dear listener, Big Fish in the Middle Kingdom. It was my original show, and I've relaunched it recently. And so, what I'm doing is I'm also checking in with a lot of people all over the world to get sort of their COVID story, right? And so, mm-hmm. I'm putting some sort of shorter chunks just on that together two or three per week and i'm going to cross post this so you may be listening to this right now on big fish in the middle kingdom i'm recording chris sanders for if i knew you better we're doing a long form interview so we're going to be on for an hour plus and really get into some cool cool stuff so if you're just hearing this this little covid snippet on big fish i encourage you to check the link in the show notes and pop over and check out the full interview with chris but let's talk about it what has been your experience it is april 9 as we record this we're we're releasing this april 10 so this is coming out the day after we record what's kind of the status right now for you and well us frankly here in la and yeah, what's 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 been your tale? You've had quite a tale with this whole whole thing. Yeah, it, it's good to. Literally one month ago, I was either I was in Vegas. I was leaving Vegas to and and, and sensing what was kind of oncoming, mm-hmm. right? Uh, coming back to L.A. to then go to what I presumed was going to be going to South by Southwest in Austin, right? And you were and just taking a you were friend. taking a super quick. You were taking a – you had just finished a job and you were taking a super quick little vacation to Vegas just to give that little yeah. chunk of content. Yeah. You were coming home to L.A. You live in L.A. Yes. So so yeah, like – so basically like two months ago, you know, I wouldn't think I'd be where I am now. But two months ago, I basically came off of three weeks of working in development and casting for a sort of paranormal ufology uh, show of yeah. which I've worked in, you know, quite a bit, you know. Right. So – I was really happy to be able like ha- I saw this window, right? I saw a window. This is a show that was hopefully going to get and go into further production. Mm-hmm. I was anticipating going back to that in sort of maybe a month's time. Right. And I saw this window of like, oh, I can go to Vegas. I can go to South by Southwest, see my mom, see old friends. Uh, I like to go to Vegas every year because the Bellagio has probably the most in America, at least, a mint shrine. I call it a shrine, but it, it's. It's 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 for the lunar animal of the year. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. this year, the year of the rat, they have. I mean, it's a gigantic, amazing. It's 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 multiple rooms, and you have this giant rat statues with money trees and all this kind of <laughs> cool stuff from all over the world to see it. Yeah, and it's just it's it's a really neat spectacle. So I always like to go there around the lunar new year, and and see that and just kind of kick back a little bit, and the vibes were already sort of setting in though. You know, mm-hmm. like 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 news news of Wuhan and like yeah. Americans. You know, the buzz in America was like, yeah, this these these ill winds are blowing in. You know, yeah. kind of kind of, but it, it, it hadn't quite set in yet, though. But so yeah. that vibe was there yeah. in Vegas. I basically re- I basically woke up on a Sunday, said like, oh, uh, ironically enough, like this this week is the last week to go see this okay. this uh, showing at the show because they yeah. tear it down after that. They leave it up for six weeks. Um, 
And so I just rented a car, went to Vegas, booked a cheap hotel, saw and and, and saw some friends, ate some good yeah. food, kicked back after three weeks of you know production, pre-production type stuff where you know yeah eating all day drink, every sleep. day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. uh and and then you know, came back and was like, well, you know, I'm going to Austin in a few days too. But I'd been hearing all the buzz about South by Southwest being canceled. Yeah, you know, but it was, but uh, it, but it was not canceled yet. It was, it, yeah, yeah, it, it, it had been canceled yet. Yeah. It had, uh, it hadn't been canceled, but it, pretty much everyone knew it was going to be canceled. Yeah, and it was. Um, but and so that was one of those things where I was debating: Well, do I travel right now? You still go? And at that time, there was no, there was no uh, COVID cases in Austin at all, and and I was like, you know what? And and honestly, this is it's, this is one of these things where like, if you watch the news and you observe what's going on in the world, you're, you're like, yeah, shit's about to hit the fan. Yeah, it hasn't yet, but it is. And you never know what happens when shit hits the fan. And I was like, well, I'm gonna go see my mom. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna go yeah. see my old friends. Yeah, and I did. You know, yeah. um, one of the unfortunate parts is that like normally I can go to Austin, stay with friends, mm-hmm. and you know, multiple friends that offered me places to stay were like. Sorry, you know, like, and I, I was literally one of the people, one of the reasons why South by South was shut, was shut down is like people coming from the West Coast. Yeah. Where there yeah. are cases, you know, traveling. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I made a, I made a joke on my Instagram about really what I, I have. A, if you've read Stephen King's The Stand, there's a yeah. character in it, Randall Flag. Yeah. And, he, and it's always been kind of one of my favorite characters because, you know, Stephen King has this ability to make these, these evil characters have some style, you know, and he's sure. like a cowboy boot and he wears a, a denim jacket that has all these buttons on it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, in my mind now, it's Brad Pitt and like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but but it, it's Brad yeah. Pitt in that wardrobe and that's that's yeah, my yeah, current exactly. Randall flag in my head. Precise. You know? No, no yeah, offense precise. to Brad. <laughs> which, 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 you know, he sets up, you know, all the evil people go to Vegas too. You know, all the, all the good right. people go to Boulder. All of you people go to Vegas. It makes a lot of sense, but but he has like (laughs) buttons that say, um, you know, like how's your pork? And he has a button with uh, uh, like a peace sign, and he has a button with like hail the red king. And so I made up a a jacket one time to like be able to go like costume parties like this. I was like, I said like I'm tempted to wear this jacket. You know, wear that on your trip to Austin. (laughs) Trip to Austin. (laughs) That might be a little on the nose. Yeah, but uh, it was it was a very much a like haha too soon sort of thing. And in retrospect, you know, should we be making jokes about this stuff? Right. No. No. But, but I literally, it's it's weird. I literally felt like that though. Like literally, like me going from the West Coast to Austin, ran, ran off. I am one of the people that's a potential plane carrier in a way, right? Like that yeah. is the worry. But I mean, I think people on the West Coast though had already been really taking this seriously, you know. People yeah. had already friends of mine, communities I'm aware of, uh, from from San Diego to Seattle. Yeah, like shutting down uh, public events people, and gatherings. I saw people, and, you know, advocating social distancing. I yeah. saw people taking all the steps that, like, you know, our local and federal governments yeah. had yet to condone yeah. or you know press yeah. upon us, yeah. and that was cool. Yeah, and that and, and honestly, I mean, here I am talking about this as someone who did travel, but you know, a big part of me almost canceled all those plans. Right. But it was also like, well, you know, this is kind of one of my last windows too. So yeah. anyway, I went to Austin, South by Southwest was canceled. I couldn't stay with friends and, and I saw a lot of people doing a lot of dumb shit. You know, I saw what I think a lot of the country was doing, uh, before there were cases and such. Yeah. Um, uh, and and not taking this seriously, so, 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 and so, so, so socializing like an evangelist family at Bob Evans. Exactly, people still get big crowds. You know, Austin, all that kind of stuff. What I ended up doing though, I basically went and stayed with my my mom one night, and realized like you know she's one of the vulnerable. Honestly, I'm one of the vulnerable. I have high blood pressure, like most people in their forties, and I realized you know I'm just going to hunker down and some Airbnbs and hotels mm. while I'm here yeah. primarily yeah. Uh, not, not put her at risk because literally while I was there, like clockwork COVID cases started appearing. Okay. Um, from very specific sources. Like I sure. think it was the wife, the university of Texas had gone to New York mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. it looked like, like people that had gone to New York and come back to Austin. That's where it was coming from. Right. You know, I'm not trying to blame 
or right. whatever. And, well, like, and not to spoil the plot, but but and you've been back. It's been a while. I mean, you're you're fortunately not you know you're not sick or anything. So so joking aside, we know it wasn't you. But the point is that yes, travelers were were probably importing these cases. I uh, I cut my trip short actually. I right, literally, I you know, that. my plan was to be there a good like ten days or so. I I I cut it in half. I paid extra money to fly back earlier. I I I got you know had to turn in the car. It it, it cost about a thousand bucks extra than I was anticipating. You know, which kind wow. of sucks, right? In a time of no work, and uh, you know, I can't say that my rental car company or my airline have been helpful or even communicative at all for like you know. Having to change flights and flight that isn't packed. I'll try to re- turn trying to refund plane. a difference on the car. Yeah, things I like turned that. my car in. Uh, I turned my car in. You know, earlier three days earlier than I'm supposed to, and you know, oh, sorry, you should pay for the whole thing. Um, shit like that, which I know they're going to rent that car again. Yeah. But regardless, yeah, I, I I came back and I have a kind of a messed up story that really kind of put the fear of God in me in a way, which was like on the plane. Um, this isn't a packed plane. So, and it's like a midnight plane and I'm in an aisle near the back and there's a space between, there's lots of spaces in this plane. Yeah. So the dude that's like, you know, in the window seat and I'm on the aisle decides he has like friends up further closer in the plane Yeah. and go back and forth multiple times mm. during the trip. And he's like this linebacker looking dude too. So it's like, great. You know, this is always fun. <laughs> <laughs> kind of shuffle with someone in your row. Sure, sure. Uh, but near, and I have a Kindle. I have a, a Kindle I'm reading. And near the end of the flight, probably about half an hour before we touched down, uh, I, he, he got up again. And, uh, well, no, he was there. I put my Kindle on my seat and went to the bathroom. When I come back, he's gone. And I didn't think about this at first, but there was like this woman and she's in a mask. And she'd been like coughing and stuff. And she's like in my row. But like as soon as I get there, she sort of gets up and goes to the bathroom too. Right. So I'm kind of like, oh, and I was like, I was like, what was going on? I was like, that was weird. And then I noticed that my Kindle is gone. Huh. Gone. It's not in my seat anymore. And I'm like, uh, uh, um. And I finally just kind of like say to the to the stewardess there, I'm like, hey, um, I had a Kindle here. Yeah. There's a guy next to me has been moving around a lot. He was here when I left. Now he's gone. And and my first thoughts like that guy took my Kindle and went up to the front of the plane is trying to make off with it, right? Okay. But then and I'm just kind of like what is going on here? And I'm looking everyone looking on the floor, which yeah, is always lots of fun during a pandemic on a fucking plane. Yeah, yeah, touching you know, everything. Rubbing around on the floor and looking for stuff. And and then I look up and I see that the stewardess I was talking to is holding my Kindle. Mm. It's wet. Like it obviously has like wet handprints all over it. Huh. And the woman that was in the uh, aisle with me, with the mask on is coming out and I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? And, and she was like, oh, oh, she, she saw it laying on the, in an empty seat. So she took it to like, make sure she's looking out for you. I'm like, who does that? She's looking huh. out for me by bringing my device to the bathroom and getting weird shit all over it. Huh. And it was just bizarro. And I was just like, and, and people around us were kind of like, yeah, that's kind of fucked up. What the fuck is going on here? Right. And I was like, it was like really kind of sad. And it's like, why, why, a, why is this airline people like, why are they letting strangers take people's stuff to the bathroom? I don't know. It was, and obviously they're not looking at every single person that goes to the bathroom, what they're carrying, that sort of thing. Yeah. But it was just a big, it's still a mystery to me. And like, why like did why this that person- woman picked it up and then. Do you think maybe yeah, she like, thought of taking it and thought better and left it in the bathroom or and then had a story? I mean, that's hard. Well, to, I mean, hard to unpack all that. There's kind of like I mean, there's basically two things that are going on. Either she was trying to be helpful or she was trying to steal it. Probably, yeah. you know, I mean, this is near the end of the trip. Yeah. She saw something. But it, it was just, I don't know. It, it was just if she was trying to be helpful, that wasn't helpful. There might have been other ways to do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that that wasn't said, helpful. Hey, <laughs> hey, you know, in this, you know, there's a Kindle sitting here in this seat, stewardess. Yeah, please, please come save it from an uncertain is it, future. Is it someone, 
you know, or is it someone in the back? I don't know. Like, don't take it to the bathroom and get your wet hand. I don't know. Did she? It, 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 there was like a weird vibe too, where I think the stewardess was like, ch- like maybe new. I don't know. Like maybe she was trying to stuff it in her bag or something, and then didn't happen. So, I don't know. It's just it was just weird. That's the okay. last thing I want was to have this like coughing mass stranger. Yeah. Or take my devices to the bathroom and come back with handprints and wet stuff all yeah. over it and like yeah, sure. and I have to carry this off the plane now. Thanks. That's yeah. always I would say I would I would have taken that in flight magazine and wrapped it and then you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean they gave me they gave me some sanitizer. I, I scrubbed yeah. it down, wiped it down really well, all that kind of stuff. But um yeah. that was my return to L. Okay. And it was it was a return of like, okay, yeah, people are doing a lot of dumb things, people aren't using their heads. We're in this real stressful situation and I'm just, you know, I basically got back. I went to the store. I went, you know, I went to all the, uh, I went to all the LA, you know, mandatory places. I went to Target. I went to Trader Joe's. I went to Ralph's and, uh, that was about it. Bought a lot of food, spent a a lot of money on a lot of food, you know, bought like a month or two worth of food. You know, I didn't, it wasn't hoarding. It wasn't crazy, but I had luckily gone to Costco a month ago and, like I always do, bought a big economy pack, so I'm, I was kind of mm-hmm. set. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I basically did that, and I've been in quarantine for a month. You know, I, I haven't, I haven't had any food prepared by anybody else, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't uh, because that I haven't. You know, th- that's it. Besides, um, I have. You know, I've been here. Yeah, I've been taking long walks. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've Everything. Been, uh, Everything I've eaten has been from my own making, you know, yeah. uh, for, for three plus weeks or something like that, I think. And I, the, yeah, I, I, my, uh, my, my friend Naeem gave me a lift. I don't have a car here in LA. Gave me a lift. Uh, we, we, you know, we did some shopping back before things got totally crazy. Although we still didn't buy any toilet paper, for instance, couldn't get that. But, uh, but we went to, uh, the smokehouse restaurant. Mm-hmm. And 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 we were gonna we were going to have some food anyway, and he said, "Why don't we go, let's, let's go someplace pretty good? Because it might be a while before we have any." Like you're right, and it is. It was. It's like that was my last, yeah. you know, that was my, that was my last uh, my my last public outing probably three plus weeks ago. So, what are you thinking about? What let's we're gonna sort of do the the sort of the quarantine related stuff sort of mostly here in a chunk so I can share it on the other show. What are what's yeah, what's what's been you mentioned you're at home and obviously again you're you're sort you're like me, you're mostly I mean you lean a little more toward TV, but you know, we're both in film and TV world and of course development is one thing, but then actually producing or pre producing a show requires that you are with people in a place doing a yeah. thing and that's not happening now. So other than like writing and development and then maybe on the other end, some, some post-production, some editing can happen. But so what are you, what's been the immediate impact on you and what do you, what are you sort of looking at as your sort of near term reality with all this mess? Well, I, you know, I want to preface that with, yeah, those of us that do work in TV film, creative content, things of that nature. It's often a gig based yeah. economy and, and source of income. Right. So, and, and, and oftentimes there's dry spells. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for me, a month of what it's been like in some ways, mm-hmm. isn't that drastic than what some, you know, slim times I've experienced. Before. Sure. Sure. You yeah. Know? We all have uh, like all my friends that I know have the normal kind of Monday through Friday, nine to five and have had, you know, careers in that regard for years and years and years. Yeah. I can see how this is like, this can be almost traumatic, you know, it, it but for me, it's traumatic like, for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, but, it's, it's traumatic at various levels, but for me, it's like, ah, oh, spending a month, you know, having tuna sandwiches or whatever, yeah. <laughs> that's sort of my main course or whatever. Is not isn't, it's something I've done before. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, uh, the, the, uh, having to practice solitude because you don't have the money you know, kind of fuck you money to go out in LA and like go yeah. to clubs and go to bars and go to special things and go to yeah. the Hollywood bowl, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, not having that and like going months at a time, not having that and having to still enjoy your life in Los Angeles. Sure. 
Sure. Um, I'm, I'm accustomed to that. I'm, I'm accustomed to periods of time like that. Right. So in a way, it's like, okay, this feels familiar in some ways. Mm-hmm. But then obviously in so many other ways, it's not familiar. It's like in some ways I'm equipped for this. In other ways, this is a, a strange new world that like we're all experiencing together in, in certain conditions. So my experience has been familiar in some ways and you know frustrating mm-hmm. to say the least at least in others well, you know, um, how, how the frustrations it, of engage with people socially you well know? that's that's what I was going to get at is, is how is it changing your practical day-to-day behaviors how 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 is it changing more than that though sort of your outlook and how are you seeing other people react and we certainly see a ton of that stuff online but yeah how are how how right. how, how are you sort of to the degrees that you have to adapt besides the super obvious that we all know, but like you personally, what are some specific things, you know, also maybe some tips to stay sane, things like that. But like, what are your own sure. personal adaptations and what are you seeing happening amongst, amongst our fellow uh, folks here? When all this kind of started, I, I, I thought, I never would have thought that online kind of interaction stuff could get worse. Well, it has. <laughs> yeah. And Sorry. I'm going to kind of touch on that in, in a yeah. second. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, as far as like personal adaptations, what I find that I, I want the most when I, when I'm feeling for it, I'm not, not like all the time is like, I miss the sound of human voices. Right. So I encourage people. I'm not one of those people. I, I, I try to be a digital minimalist in some ways. I'm not very yeah. good at it, Yeah. but I do try to be conscious of how much time I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Gen X. I'm not, I didn't grow up on texting. Yeah. Right. I don't really like texting a lot. Yeah. I yeah. see it's, it's this and I'm not saying I don't want it in my life. But a lot of people of all age ranges just want to text all day. I don't. I don't either. And, and it drives me yeah, drives and, me fucking crazy. And yeah. I'm, I'm, hear, I'm hearing from all these random folks. And, and and hey, I if we're friends, that's awesome. But I'm hearing from people I do not know at all. And it's and it's not just like you know the bots, but it's like, hey, I just want to say, hey, what are you doing? Hey, uh, okay, well. <laughs> You know, it's been a lot of that. It's been a lot of random, like we've never talked before. You yeah. Know? And, and, yeah. And, if you, and and I'm happy to talk, but I mean, if you want to talk about something, you know, I don't want to talk about the right. weather. Well, and so th- for me, the, the things I didn't like before, right? Yeah. Like, like you, like have been, have been dialed up and sure. it's like, oh man, like, 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 like there's like a couple people that are like, I, uh, I'm messaging, you know, in various platforms too. Um, where I've said, Hey, well, let's, can, can we just like talk about this or, Hey, you can you give you a call. And like some people, you know, some people are very much like I'm discovering, think that's weird or yeah. that's, that's, or they think, they think typing on a computer is more genuine and authentic or at least equal to having a phone conversation, a voice conversation. Yeah. And I completely disagree. Sure. I completely sure. disagree. And I don't understand how anyone can think that they're like, well, this is communication. This is, you know. Or even like 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 we do sometimes like leave instead yeah. of texting a bunch yeah. leave a voice message like you're you're much better at the, at than I you know well I'm better uh, at filling up your I'm be, I'm better at filling up your thread with with ten minutes worth of them but but we but we but <laughs> yeah. we're we're used to like because we've we've been friends a long time and travel in a lot of circles and we work together on and off for years and we keep each other up to date on just general stuff. So because I'm normally in Beijing and the time difference is the time difference, yeah, yeah. it's pretty common that like I'll yeah. send you five or 10 minutes worth of messages and then whatever the eight hour differential that, oh, OK, now you're up and you've had your coffee and you're catching up on stuff yeah. and then you'll reply. And that's just kind of the routine right. in our yeah. particular case that I've, I've got this similar situation with a few dozen people, you know, but that's sure. I think that's yeah, it's it's interesting that that, that I mean especially younger people that are just really fulfilled. I mean, they just, they, they, I think they just want the touch point. You know, I think, I think that's why some people are gen- genuinely fulfilled is they like the touch point and just like even the quick text with a quick reply kind of does it. But what drives me crazy is when it's like that never ending ping pong match without, yeah. without kind of saying anything. And if it's, and if it's yeah. just to say hi and chit chat, well then, yeah, let's do, even if it's okay, let's do a 10 minute call, you know? Let, let's, yeah, let's, exactly. let's actually, let's actually chat or throw on the video and just say, Hey, for a few minutes. And, and you had much exactly. more connection with that person than like some little disembodied, 
thing. But right. yeah, you but you were saying you 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 I know you've we've talked about this a bit just amongst ourselves offline that uh I mean, you mentioned people are yeah, a lot of people are in a horribly stressed position and I'm not without stress myself, but having worked mostly for myself for most of my life, I'm yeah, I'm just used I'm busier than ever at the moment. I mean, some things are on pause or having to have a rethink, but I've got other stuff that just doesn't stop. So I'm yeah. busier than ever. And so yeah. I've had a few people just like randomly call me without a warning. And that's, that is the new paradigm, right? It, it's considered rude just yeah. to call before you kind of check in. Hey, I need to give, is it cool if I give you a quick call? Oh, give me five or give me 10 or right, tomorrow. Right, right, right. But, but I've had a few <laughs> handful of people from other sort of cultural dispositions or other, some Americans actually, but, but I've had a few people just randomly call at weird times. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's funny cause I mean, I'm, I'm, this sounds like I'm saying that I'm self-important. I don't mean it like that. Just random calls would interrupt this interview, you know, we're right. doing this on the internet. So, right. so random calls don't kind of work with the schedule, but, but we're seeing some pretty, we're seeing some, some, I mean, there's some of what's to be expected in terms of people's online, you know, good and bad political discourse, or, you know, every, we've all got our medical degrees from Google now, you know, and everybody's an amateur mm-hmm. epidemiologist, including me sometimes. But yep. we're seeing sometimes kind of some fairly desperate behavior online and some sure. sort of so, so there, there's a lot of boundary boundary crossing. I'm noticing, you know, how, what, well, what do you think of it? What are what are you seeing? What's your experience of this? Well, what what I've been dwelling on is that. Before we all went to lockdown, before COVID-19 was a word in anyone's lips, you know, I've been dwelling on – I've been taking like step backs from social media, like Facebook in particular, but also in, just, just whatever platforms, um, just because just, – just my time and energy, A, I don't want to be sucked into it too much, but also that I don't, I don't know how – like with Facebook, I just don't like it as a form of expression. Yeah. And – and – it's this kind of wild west attitude there of like just people disregarding. So, and, and I'm guilty of this too, but just disregarding things that you would do if you're having a normal conversation with someone. Right. I right. never liked that aspect of it. Right. And I've always liked to use social media as a, to- either as a tool where like I'm casting a show yeah. or I'm looking yeah. for something, yeah. want recommendations, like kind of like, you know, just the facts, man, I'm kind of, yeah, kind exactly. of pose. Yeah. Or, what I say is it's either that or like something that's just sarcastic and just kind of like yeah. off the cuff. Yeah. It's not that big of a deal. Don't take it that seriously, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And th- but th- there doesn't seem to be any room for nuance mm-hmm. or people just sort of checking in about stuff. Um, and it's it's people say they have social anxiety. I, I have like social media anxiety. <laughs> I feel <laughs> that's the core you know, of the like, show. Like, I think like. like yeah, like yeah. waiting, waiting into uh, uh, th- these social platforms sometimes, and just seeing what's going on with people. And it's like, I mean, it's like I feel like a. Uh, I posted this a few years ago. It's like I feel like we're in an era where like people. I've literally been told this too. Like they judge you on your silence on social media. Right. And I'm kind of like, well, yeah. you understand that this isn't like mandatory right yeah we this understand like, this is we didn't all sign up and say like facebook is now my official voice and platform for everything i think about and everything i hold dear and every opinion and political alliance and thing that i support no it's not like when did it become that when did yeah. we all agree that facebook is our voice yeah. or if you're an instagram person, that's your voice or snapchat sure, is your sure, voice, sure. I mean, this kind of stuff which by the way I've, i'm i'm you know, I'm patting myself on the back as a good Gen Xer here of like, I still don't have Snapchat, you okay. know, and I don't, I don't want to add your Snapchat. I had it and I just, you know, I understand that it's for, 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 you know, we, I, I it, it's not for me. Yeah. It was, it's, it's yeah. not for me basically. But I just, yeah, it's funny that, um, there's, there's so many things we can talk about in these regards, but that's just sort of like, so that's, I've been meaning to make a big post for a while of like, Hey, I'm just kind of letting people know that like, you know, I've stepped back from this. Um, I don't want to be too much time or energy. Yeah. I'm not, I don't really like this platform. I see a lot of like heads budding and that sort of stuff. Sure. Um, I feel like people judge you for not saying things, which is kind of weird. Yeah. You know, yeah. when people get like, oh, your silence is telling. It's like, we're not standing next to each other. You know, we're mm-hmm. not having coffee. We're talking. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like this is a computer and it's a, yeah. it's, a, it's, it's a thing that we all participate in voluntarily and give all our time and energy and, you know, data to all day long. Sure. Uh, yeah, maybe based. I don't have to do that. I have plenty of friends that, uh, don't have any social media yeah. and you know what? They're great people. And I like hanging out with them in person more than I like arguing on the internet or having yeah. to explain myself on the internet when there's, uh, miscommunications or people, people make a lot of assumptions that think about things too. I'm, mm-hmm. I see that a lot. It's like you, you say something and then that turns into this whole big thing of like, wait, no, but I didn't say that. You know, Th- this is one thing I've been thinking about a lot. This is something that really frustrates me. What I see online is a lot of, you know, people use the word echo chamber and it's cliche, but it's true. I see a lot of people that all day long, all they do is like, say something, here's my statement, and then everyone hops on and agrees with them, right? And if one person, and I'm not even saying disagrees, if one person says anything that isn't like complete agreement, right, Mm -hmm. people flip out. People get upset. People take like you not agreeing with them as like an attack. It's it's like it's like a digital version. Uh, There were less politically um, less politically correct names for this game when I was a kid, but uh, a a a slightly more family friendly name is uh, is kill the guy with the ball. <laughs> like like on the playground, you know, like you know the the rule was like. You kind of kick the oh, ball yeah. around, and then like there's on a certain, like you know, on kick number five, whoever gets it, they got to run, and you got to get them. <laughs> Try to tackle them and yeah. beat the hell out of yeah. them. And so it's become like a digital version of kill the guy with the ball. If you're the guy that dares to weigh in, you know, with 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 something like you said that's 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 not part of the doctrinaire line of that particular right. little. It's like who has t- what grown up has time for this. Yeah, what, exactly. what 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 grown up gives it any weight or has time for this? You know, yeah. I don't I don't have well, I have I have less than zero interest or time. It, it, it fulfills nothing in my life to and and I appreciate that there are personality types who, you know, they're they're they're. Uh, I'm the Capricorn with a Taurus rising, Pisces moon. I tend to be a little more. I, that's what that means for y'all non hippie people is I'm I'm pretty grounded in the earth. You know, I got like a deep emotional life, but I'm pretty grounded in the earth and practical concerns, right? We're going to get into philosophical chunk in a second, but you're one of my philosophical uh, advisors. Would you, that's a fair summary, would you say? Well, yeah, yeah, I'd say that certainly. Yeah. uh, But, but, and and other people are like, I was talking uh, with a friend earlier, actually, um, well, it's 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 right here. If you're listening to this on the Big Fish in the Middle Kingdom podcast, there's one other of these of a short interview kind of talking about this whole COVID quarantine situation and your personal experience. John Peterson, who's the other guest on this show, um, I think I'm going to put him first uh, and wrap up with you. He just talked about uh, just just earlier. We just had our call before I'm having this chat with with you here. He was basically saying, you know, like basically as a kid, which which, when I really knew when we were tight friends, he was very introverted. Now he's become an extrovert over 30 odd years. And so Mm -hmm. he's going totally crazy, you know? Yeah. yeah. And you're much more, I mean, you're, I think you're more of a balanced guy, but I mean, you definitely have your extroverted side as well as your go, let me go into the cave side. Yeah. And I'm more of a cave guy. I mean, the cave is my, the the womb is, my, my home is my womb. You know, I have a home office wherever I am, basically. So for you, are you, uh, I I think, I mean, basically some people are not, some people are are wired to handle it better. And some people are wired to be super sensitive at this time. And again, plus there's tons of people with economic wretchedness, you know, because their kind of job, you know, it's like you show up and that's how you get paid. And if you can't show up, you're screwed. So. What yeah. are you? What are you? What are you looking at? as some of the, as we sort of wrap up this chunk. But I want to get your your thoughts before we move on. What do you see? What are your? What are you thinking about longer term? Like what's what's kind of your wild crystal ball guess about how this might could possibly should hopefully will play out, and uh, and what's kind of your strategy for for getting to the end of that without going crazy. 
Good question. Um, well, let me just say, I'm a Gemini with a Capricorn rising. There you and go. <laughs> back in my, my MySpace bio, I had uh, all these descriptions of myself that were kind of like seemingly paradoxes, but they're not. They're all part of me. And, and one was that I was, I, I'm a gregarious misanthrope. <laughs> right. Which I love that play by Voltaire, right? I love it. Because I always felt, you know, I'm one of those people who's like, you know, I'm one of the X-Men. I'm, I'm apart from society. You know, people look at me weird, you know, yada, yada sort of stuff. Um, but, I mean, I like, I love humanity. I like exploring parts of humanity. I like societies. I like going out, mixing it up and all this sort of stuff. But in a lot of ways, I, I am an introvert in a way that, like, I need my alone time. I'm, ha- I'm fine being alone. It doesn't bother me too much. Uh, and or like being with a close knit group of people yeah. so we can have deeper conversations and connections that way. Uh, and as far as solutions now for people being isolated, you know, I, I, I want to touch on because we, you know, we, we, we criticize sort of social media culture, but th- there's so many aspects that I do like. And I do get that everyone has different needs, different ways they want to express themselves. And one of the it's, it's the double edged sword of I feel like a lot of people like myself didn't grow up with social media. Yeah. Well, every human wants a voice. Everybody wants a voice, right? And social media has provided people with a voice, and especially people that are introverted or don't get out much yeah. or shy or, or w- whatever it may be, um, but do want a voice. Social media has provided that. And mm-hmm. that's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. Sure. It's a healthy thing to be able to speak your piece and be able to have a voice and to right. be heard. And that's a good thing. I just think people, when you let that become – your official voice or the yeah. voice that you put all your emotional energy around. Yeah. I don't think is a good thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's what causes some problems in genuine communication with people. Right. So it's good that we all have a voice though. It's good that the modern technology has given creative types, um, the capacity for, you know, at least, a, at least a couple decades now to do things that were only in the hands of the wealthy and, and people with the resources and, and whatnot before. You know, you can do, you can film a movie on your iPhone now. You know, you don't need right. a production company. Um, right. I don't want to see it, but you can do it. Things, so <laughs> I'm just kidding. A lot of people, there have been some you know, great ones like that. Yeah, exactly. So obviously, um, I'm trying to encourage myself and encourage others. Let this be a creative time. Let this be, yeah. let it be that time to write that book. Let it, let it be that time to work on those projects. Keep your, keep your, uh, yourself busy with, with some sort of, creative outlets but you know i've also you know you, you, that's the whole thing you get barraged by all these memes right everyone thinks they're an expert and has the best advice for everything yeah and a lot of people are like oh you know if you don't like be productive during this time then you're just lazy but it's also like you know what this is the first month and honestly this is what i did i came back and i realized at some point i was going to do a fast i'm actually going to start that kind of easter weekend kind of thing right okay. kind of line it up with like a cleanse that i do every year yeah, and yeah. we've talked about yeah I do like yeah a week cleanse, and you know, I always feel really good about it. And I could, um, and, and I do it kind of like clockwork each year. So I was like, all right, uh, I'm just gonna eat whatever I want for two weeks. I'm mm. gonna eat ice cream and and spaghetti mm, and yeah. whatever. Eat all the things. Uh, eat all the things, and then I'm gonna ease into a cleanse, and then I'm gonna do that, and then kind of see where we're at. And so, like, you asked, what's what's my long term yeah. advice? Yeah. My long term advice is to. Uh, well, a hopefully everybody just took that month to just kind of chill and not pressure themselves and not feel like they had to do anything other than sit around their PJs. You know, I think that's cool because my feelings are that people are looking at this as like something that's happened. Yeah, the pandemic, and the mm-hmm. COVID, and the mm-hmm. lockdown, and the quarantine. Uh, this is like the opening act. Yeah, you know, yeah. this isn't something that's happened in the past. Yeah, if this is like the whole show, and all, either you're a conspiracy theorist or if this is just whatever yeah. it is. Um, this is the opening act. Yeah. Like yeah. we don't even know what's behind the curtain yet. We don't even know what the, the first act is going to entail when they really start telling the story. Yeah. Right? This, this is, is the prologue. Yeah. This is this the, or, is, this, this is, is the this prologue. is the, this is the origin story for the fifth element. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, so this is like, how we ended up living in a pod and you've got to have a, every, you got to be scanned at every step of the way to do every single thing. And yeah. You know, let us see so, your digital papers. Constantly. Th- th- this past month, is the opening act. Yeah. This isn't, this isn't something that's happened already. Like we are seeing the, the very first beginning of a lot of things that are going to happen and develop. And we and, and the best thing to do really is just kind of like relax, take a deep breath and, you know, observe what's happening. That's what I'm trying to do. 
Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to observe just a month into the future here and that. And like with a, a month ago, it was like, I'm going to quarantine for a month and just kind of chill and not pressure myself, not beat up myself, um, be safe, be cautious and just be kind of be gentle, you know, yeah. but now that, you know, we're going into a second month, it's like, okay, it, it's tough. It's tough. You know, I'm zeroing in some creative projects. You know, I'm doing things like this. I'm, I'm having a lot more zooms these days. Um, you know, you and I are Freemasons and tomorrow we're putting on a zoom for a, was normally a public ceremony. So it's right. not one of our secret rules or whatever. It's, it's a public ceremony we do where we honor our deceased brethren of the past year. Yeah. And I'm, uh, there's, 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 there's various bodies to the Scottish rite and, and I'm as the wise master of the chapter of Rose Croy. Yeah. And one of the, one of the things that we, we do every year is hold this ceremony where we, we, we light candles, put them out, and then relight them as sort of a, a rededication and remembrance of, of those who have passed, but the, the, this, this, you know, the world of the living that we're in too. Mm-hmm. And it always happens in spring. And that was one of my disappointments is that uh, we weren't be able to put this on. And I said, well, this is a public ceremony. Let's just uh, make a Zoom version of this, yeah. allow people to come, watch it. And so, you know, we're two months ago, I've never would have thought I'd be doing Masonic ceremony over a Zoom. And yeah. here we are. And I'm really happy of all the people that came together to 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 put this on. And we're going to do it tomorrow. And, you know, I think you might be watching. And it's 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 cool. It's something that's never been done before. I'm, I'm, and so out of this, th- cool things are happening, you know? Yeah. Well, I yeah. am going to – I'm going to give us a clean little bookend on this section. We are not at all done yet. So if you're listening on Big Fish in the Middle Kingdom and you want to hear more – and if that perhaps got you curious to know a little bit more about this Chris Sanders guy and what we're going to talk about, please go find If I Knew You Better. The link is in the show notes here on Big Fish. So I'm going to tell you thank you for this, and we're going to continue on. So thanks for this section. Do you have any Do you have any um, places online where you direct people to, to, to stalk you, or do you, do you send people to like a Twitter or an Instagram, or you uh, do you have a real publicly um, facing thing at this point, or you kind of pulled it back? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm on Facebook as Chris Sanders. I'm on Instagram as Mr. Zopher, M I S T E R X O F E R. And I, I believe that's my Twitter too. I think I've posted two, three times and, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> don't expect don't too much exciting Twitter. content on Chris's Twitter, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I have, I have a LinkedIn profile. I haven't updated in half a year, you know, all the sure, good stuff. Sure. All right. Uh, but you know, I mean, if you can, people want to find me, they find me. You know, I'm not the Chris Sanders of, of Disney fame and that recently did Call of the Wild and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all that good stuff. But, yeah. Uh, he's coming out with the Comic Con. But yeah, that's uh, that's that's where they can find me. Um, I, I have an IMDb. I'm Chris Sanders, I believe, 25. You oh. know? Yeah. I'm, I'm Chris, Chris Sanders XV. Got and it. you can go there and see. That's usually where I direct people when they're like, well, what have you produced? Blah, blah. I was like, okay, well, you can go see. I. Was a producer in 78 episodes of every single one of my ghost story. You can see this movie, that movie, that film, this and that. You can see all my weird tentpole film background days in 2007 on yeah. <laughs> Pirate of the Caribbean and Alice in Wonderland and Transformers 50 or whatever. And, you know. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, you've had a hell of an eclectic story, Chris. Thank you for this. Let's continue, man. We're going to go way back. Let's let's do the way back machine Specifically, however, I'd love to hear because Austin is such a cool town, and kind of the world knows Austin's cool now. But you grew up there. What yeah. was just maybe even just a snapshot because your 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 coming to LA story is one of the more interesting and fascinating ones. I know very personally profound um, because as we're, we're going to get into some fairly philosophical subject matter, you, you mentioned we're both, um, we're both Freemasons and both in the Scottish Rite, And so we're going to get into some interesting things, but I want to throw those little tidbits out because there's some context in your coming to LA story that, that I think that would be helpful to have that information. But what was, what was Austin like? You know, I mean, what was Austin like for you growing up? What, what how, how do you think it sort of shaped you into becoming, the uh, interesting, cool weirdo that you are now. Said with affection. Um, yeah, no, I, I see that. That's an apt description, and it's, it's like a it's like a badge for me in some ways to know that I grew up in Austin. 
and and took what Austin used to be, you know, and kind of hold it in my heart. There's a so I mean every time I go back to this is Austin is a, is a unique place, and that's why zillions of people have moved there over the years. And back in though you know seventies, eighties, nineties, it was. I mean, this is for the day. I saw like Nirvana play when I was a skater punk, you know, on their Bleach album. I think it was 1989, 90 wow. type of stuff. You know? mm-hmm. It's it's a it's a city known for, you know, uh, for well, you go into the airport and they let you know it's the live music capital of the world, and it's yeah. sort of had that claim to fame since sort of the 60s and 70s with the whole kind of cosmic cowboy, you know, movement, all the blues, just lots of cool stuff. Yeah, you know, it it was like a a a place where you could just go downtown, go to different places. There's always music playing and be exposed to that, you know, and it's, and we in Austin knew we sort of had a good thing as being the sort of oasis in the midst of what's Texas. a lot of kind of like stereotypical <laughs> Texas, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. Um, yeah. being, being a city where like, you know, you could be kind of weird. Like you can be yeah. a gay person. You, yeah. you could, you, you could be someone that's not from just, you know, complete, uh, you know, redneck culture, which I, which I, you know, I've basically where you, you could be something that's not a complete Southern stereotype. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. You know, well, where you be, can, be, being, being from the South, you, I totally understand and relate to that. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, Athens, Georgia so, was, there was the possibility in Athens and Atlanta, although that's another story. It's my story, but you're, but yeah, if, for right. you, for the Austin, it's cause it's changed a lot. And now, you know, South by Southwest conference is now this major, major thing that you alluded to in your, in your introduction. And, um, in the beginning of your, your, your quarantine chasing, getting ahead of the quarantine story. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, uh, Austin, the spirit that Austin had sort of developed is what became kind of commodified and commercialized and marketed yeah. to the world. And it's still there to degree, but it's also, it's, it's sort of, it, it's, it's sort of packaged hipness now. I mean, yeah. well, there's, I mean there, Austin, there, there's like a vegan cold brew, you know, non GMO coffee place on like every other corner. And, and that's, and not that that's a bad thing, <laughs> but, well, but it's what, kind of become that. The thing is, so, I mean, Austin used to be full of characters, you know, a lot, I mean, I mean, you know, Austin was Slacker. If you ever saw Slacker, yeah. you ever saw Richard yeah. Linklater's first film that won him acclaim and like sort of set him on his path, yeah. that was Austin, you know, just all sorts of random weird characters is very sort of a college town at that point. Um, it was, it was a liberal oasis, but you still right, right next to all the things that, you know, I mean, good things about Southern culture, you know, um, sure. lots of amazing food, yeah. you know, when I was going to say food, <laughs> yeah, everyone here is, uh, uh, terrified of my three favorite things, you know, cheese, sour cream and, and butter, which <laughs> I mean, those are my, that's not my three favorite things, but those are, those are kind of yeah. like, you know, staples uh, of, that, that's, uh, that's a good start to a list though of, 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 of you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of good food in Texas, you know, exactly. but, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's 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 just I don't know. It makes me sad when I go back to Austin. There's so much development, all these skyscrapers, all these places. Like I grew up on the, I grew up on the east side. You know, um, I grew up in a, uh, where if you know if I rode my bike more than a mile one direction, it was like you know kind of cracking hookers. You know, honestly, I mean it, it was like any town where you had your pockets of of you know kind of bad stuff going on. And but but it was also like. You know, like Austin isn't – well, okay, so so long story short though, like those are all like gentrified like bar neighborhoods now with a guy in suspenders and a, and a, and a handlebar mustache that wants to make you a mixology drink for $18 fucking dollars. <laughs> I don't need to – He's got his atomizer. Fuck? He's got his battery-powered atomizer in the little cart. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like – and it's been it's been that way for a good solid 15 years too. Yeah. You know, right. it's, um, it's not the Austin I grew up in and – you know, the traffic's really bad. Um, but like, I mean, the, like it's just been engulfed with suburbia mm-hmm. in every direction possible, tons mm-hmm. of construction, but and in a lot of ways it's lost its soul. You know, I'm just going to say it. And most of my friends that still live there agree with this. And mm-hmm. like, I, I, you know, you, and then like, like I said, it's been this way for a long time where all the places used to have the kind of neat kind of mom, pa music venue bars and such are all like, just like cheesy yuppie clubs, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, and I'm not saying that's 100% in Austin now. 
Sure. But it's overwhelmingly present yeah. that most people there are, you know, bridge and tunnel crowd or they're not they're not from Austin. They may not probably not even from the south. Um, they're from somewhere else and they went to Austin because they it's 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 a, it's a party town. You can do a lot of cool stuff and eat a lot of good food and have a lot yeah. of fun. But like a lot of the charm and, and you know, keep Austin weird. You know, they yeah. were the first well, to, well, to coin the term. And, yeah. and Austin hasn't done a good job of keeping weird, though, honestly. Like, yeah. it it's kind of sucks, but it's like, what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, it, it's funny because I, I found myself in a conversation with somebody once. Austin came up talking about it and like, what's it like? And I said, well... You know, I said the, the people who used to really be attracted to Austin, it's like, you know, the actor Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's kind of out there. Uh, you know, there was a whole thing where like he got, you know, arrested for like being howlingly drunk and like playing bongos naked with his friend in the backyard. And yeah. the night, I would say, yeah, OK, well, uh, he lives in Austin. Yeah. And imagine it, it used to be like, you know, a few thousand Matthew McConaughey's who weren't famous. <laughs> Like guys who, yeah, you know, exactly. on a random Tuesday at 3 a.m. might be playing bongos naked in the backyard around a campfire and howling. Right, right. <laughs> you no. Know? no, I mean, that was there, pretty part there of the was re- Yeah, there was a reason why, like, Quentin Tarantino fell in love with Austin in the 90s, you know, yeah. and I, I ran into him and, and uh, Robin Rodriguez in, a, in the diner I always hang out at, you know, one time in, I think, 97 and, like, was like, you know – had that little slice of being able to like eavesdrop in, in that conversation. And, you know, it's why like film blew up in Austin and they, they, a lot of stuff got made there. You know, it's why people like Robert, you know, Robert Rodriguez known for doing Pharmaco. Like that was what you did. I did Pharmaco. Like back in the day, it was a thing called Pharmaco and mm-hmm. you'd go and they test drugs on you and you'd stay in this place for a week. And yeah. like, I was basically taking like shit loads of, of, of aspirin on like a low protein diet or whatever, but you like play pool and watch TV and you get like 2000 bucks and yeah. he used that for El Mariachi yeah. and I went to Tokyo instead. And that was like 98, but like <laughs> shit like that was like what you did in Austin, you know, yeah. like you, you, you like, yeah. <laughs> it was still this kind of scrappy, but like innovative, fun, neat place. And now it's all like tech bros and oxygen bars and just, well, that's I more know, LA. I think people, they're not. That's more LA. That's the same. People still are still like injecting butter and sour cream and cheese into their veins. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, true. Their faces. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, it's the, still the, yeah. South. the the drinking. It, it's people. People talk about and for a guy who's like a third Irish and whose name is Brendan, you would. Think, I haven't been to Ireland yet, but what I understand is that pretty much almost everybody's drunk after a certain point in the day. And I think Austin would give Ireland a yeah. run for its money in terms of the drinking culture. It's pretty, right, pretty, right. pretty committed, pretty committed to well, that. I don't know if this is true anymore, but I used to say people are always like, well, why did you leave Austin? Are you going to go back? It's like I've been in L.A. 20 years. Yeah, I'm staying. I like it. I'm an Angelina yeah. now. This is my home. Yeah. But Austin prepared me to to, I think, fit in in a lot of because L.A. is a place with a lot of characters, too. And also, I feel yeah. like L.A. has more – like as far as like bang for your buck in that regard though, L.A. has way more than Austin does these days, especially when I go back. It's, it's, it's a weird feeling like I go back and like I'm the character. I'm the local boy here and I'm the character now because everyone is just so kind of – you know, yeah. like – but – They came for the t-shirt. Yeah. They came, I, to, I, they, they came I, to take a selfie with one of those giant Gibson guitars, which are cool. This is one thing I don't see with Austin where back in the day, like we were all like everyone was in a band. Everyone was in like three bands and you could be in like three bands and play like every night of the week, you know, and you could I'd always say Austin had this curse that you could be super huge in Austin. I had friends that got super huge in Austin and sort of the greater Texas area, but never quite broke it on that national level, right. you know, right. and there's a reason why the film was slacker and that it was the perfect place to sort of be in a bubble and be a big fish. Yeah. In a small pond in a way, you know, but like I wanted more, you know, I wanted to get, I didn't want that to, I didn't want that to happen to me, you know? Um, and like I'd done Pharmaco, I'd gone to Tokyo for a month in 98, stayed with a good friend there. And I got that itch of there's a bigger world out there. Right. And I graduated from college, was working in a record store, had a degree in directing. And I was like, I just need to get out of this town. Yeah. You know, I've had my, you know, friends of mine were smoking crack, all sorts of weird shit. Mm -hmm. It was like, Now's the time to go. You know, I've yeah. kind of been there and done that. And this was like and late like, 90s, oh, like, right? 99? This is, this is 90. This is 90. This is 99. 99. Uh, well, this is 98, actually. Okay. So this is 98. 
Um, I went to Tokyo that summer, and by the end of that year, I packed my bags, bought a one-way ticket to London, and moved because they speak they sort of speak English in London, you know. Uh, I, uh, my, uh, my English I, listeners I, are gonna, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll I'll put that email address in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. No. No, I, well, I'm just saying, like, uh, that's my little that's my little dumb joke. Like, sure, sure. No, so I was like, I, the point being is that I had thought about like, oh, going to Tokyo and teaching English. I'm like, I was like, no, I don't want to be somewhere where I'm illiterate. You know, if I'm going to move to another country, uh, and then when people ask me, well, what'd you do in London? I basically say cry because I, I found out, I found out real quick that it's really expensive here. And this is like this is like the worst time ever. This is when the dollar was low on the pound. Oh, you okay. know? This is like expensive to go to London. So, this you, brought, like, so you brought your yeah. sad little dollars over and then it's like – Yeah, exactly. McDonald's I lived is $20? In a, yeah. <laughs> in a North London called Tottenham mm-hmm. and uh, basically kind of like one of the only white kid for as far as I could see in some ways. But And when I say that though, it's like London's very different. You know, it's like it's like Hasidic Jews and like Turkish communities and like, you know, Jamaican communities, Chinese communities, like, you know, a big hodgepodge of – and, and I say basically London prepped me for Los Angeles because I actually liked that. I mean that was one of the reasons I moved. It's like I want to experience right. something more than Austin. Yeah. I want to experience like a big mess of other cultures and people from all over the world. Mm-hmm. And that's what you kind of do with London as someone who isn't English. The English don't really want to my, – my general experience was and they told me first day like, yeah, no one – none of the local people want to make friends with tourists you know, or mm-hmm. make friends that people just kind of come here somewhere else. They've yeah. been here for a month. No. I get it. You know, um, So you make friends from – Switzerland or Japan or yeah, like fellow travelers. Yeah. One of, one of my best friends I made there was this Scottish dude and he was like an aspiring poet and all this kind of stuff. And he was obsessed with mod culture, Sean Michael Wilson. Right. Mm. And he was cool. And I would go to like, he was really into the mod scene and having a Vespa and, and, you know, uh, you know, a fifth beetle haircut and kind of going, <laughs> like, but that's London. like you have all this kind of weird stuff going on. Yeah. You know, I was living with ravers you know, that would like be on ecstasy for three days every weekend, you know, and yeah. like go to these cra- – and like I went to some – these crazy dance parties, which like was nothing like America at all. I mean it was bonkers. It was neat. You know, it was 1998, 1999 in London. Um, I don't regret it at all, you know, yeah. but it was – it was it wasn't easy and it wasn't tough. And what had happened is – what brought me to LA is that I met this girl at a a – kind of very nerdy convention in Salt Lake City a week before I moved to London. And she's someone I had met online, you know, as part of this one community. And I was there for, and I met her there. We had this tour de fair and like, and I went to London and was pining for her the whole time. And we stayed in communication and she lived in Los Angeles. And, uh, ultimately uh, her parents were from Israel. So ultimately I, I basically, uh, Went to Prague first, then to Israel, met up with her there, spent some time there, which, by the way, taking ecstasy in Jerusalem is, is quite interesting. <laughs> like, okay. rolling around the hills in a taxi, like, going like, oh, man, this is where all this is where shit's it happened, going man. down. <laughs> Whoa. You know, like, Jerusalem was interesting. And uh, I think I went there right when the infatata of that era was, like, dialing up and hadn't gotten too bad yet. But, um... It was intense. It was interesting. Um, yeah. I haven't been back since, but I'm glad I went there. And then uh, this is something. I, this is this is very much a cautionary tale, though, and that I tell people like, you know, don't fall in love online or mm-hmm. someone you've spent a day or two with because you know traveling is a good way to get to know someone. And and we went to Rome. We went to Torino. We went to Lyon. Had lots of fun. Went to Barcelona, but in France, when we're in Paris, you know, we walk down the Champs Elysees. We get to the Louvre and take a picture of me. There's a great picture of me with you know, giving the peace sign from the triangle mm-hmm, where mm-hmm. you know, Dan Brown's you know bones of Mag- Mary Magdalene are buried or whatever. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we're in front of the Louvre, and the assumption is we're going to go in. And I'm like, hey, all right, let's go in. She's like, no. I'm like, well, what? She's like, well, I don't really like art. Oh my gosh! Like, like literally, I'm wow. I'm, I'm quote, and I'm like, what do you <laughs> I mean? I don't like, like art. Like, we're I'm like, just humor me here. Then I don't know. Like, what else are we gonna do? Yeah, Which obviously we're in Paris, in Paris and really, there's a lot to do. But that's one of the things you probably want to do if it's your first time in Paris. Yeah. That's the thing you should do. Yeah, 
You go see this, the Mona Lisa. You can't go to Paris. Else. It's online. It's awesome. Check it out. But please continue. Well, anyway, that was uh, the beginning of the end. Mm, okay. You know, and in some ways where I realized, oh, well, hmm, maybe this isn't my life mate, you know? Yeah. Uh, but basically, I move in with her, move into L.A., uh, a little apartment off of San Vicente in La Brea. And eight months later, I'm living in, in uh, this kind of like weird rental place in Culver City. Um, going like, wow, I have no friends here. I don't know anyone. This kind of sucks. I thought I was going to move here and get married to this person. And I live in LA now in a weird little apartment. Is this that little, little apartment room. that Carl ended up living in later? The same place? No. Okay. No. Okay. That place was a lot better. Little, this, little, this little, 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 little Carl King reference, a, a, uh, a yeah. musician and director friend. Anyway, please continue. <laughs> He lived in one of your former places that was a little bit of a, it was like basically a party house and he's the least party guy who who I know in my 52 years on earth. (laughs) And he was living in like the raging party house, (laughs) like trying to like be head down in his room and do his thing. But please continue. I'm on a tangent on my tangent. It was, uh, well, so this was kind of in that neighborhood too. And it's kind of a neighborhood kind of stuck around this whole time. It's, 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 it's the neighborhood that the Masonic Lodge of which I became a master is in. Mm -hmm. And, and like that journey, that eight year journey started when I had moved out and I'm sitting there and my car's in the shop and I'm really depressed. And I like, I, 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 I like prayed. I just like put it out there. Like whoever's listening, you know, give me something to uplift me. You know, on this day, like I'm like, this is one of my lowest points right here. Like I'm, my life has changed. It's kind of how it feels. Some something like, wow, everything changed so quick. Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't. Wanna, I don't know anyone. And I was like, well, I'm going to go to the beach. I'm going to go to Venice Beach. Mm-hmm. That always cheers me up. Watching the sunset over the Pacific. Mm-hmm. And I and I go. I just walk up to Venice Boulevard to get on the bus, which I know ends in Venice. Yeah. I don't even think about what the numbers are and the number 33 bus pulls up and Mm -hmm. number 33 has always had significance for me on a personal level, but also has Masonic significance. And you know, a lot of people are in numerology 33, you know, there's a lot, you could, you could write books have been written on the number 33. Regardless, I see bus 33. I'm like, okay, that's a sign, right? I get on, I go to Venice, I walk around still depressed end of the day. I'm waiting for the bus again. There was, there was a, a homeless lady kind of having an episode over by one of the bus stops and screaming and yelling and frothing at the mouth, kind of like one that seemed like she could like attack somebody. Yeah. So you're going to find another way to go. Well, I was at a different, like I was basically down the block a little and these two girls, these twins, these Russian twins that were there too, kind of like ran away and like ran up to me and like, Hey, can we come stand near you? (laughs) I'm like, yeah, cool. cool." I'm like, what do y'all do? And they're like, well, we're going to go to, the Hare Krishna temple and get free food because they give out food at the end of the night that they don't use. I'm like, really? I'm like, that sounds kind of good actually. You know, like I like Indian food. Like, let's do it. Cause they invited me. They're like, yeah, you should come with us. And I'm like, well, and and it's on Venice Boulevard and Mm -hmm. we take the bus there and I get off right there in the corner and I notice, Oh wow. There's a Masonic lodge here that I never saw before. Yeah. I've passed by this way a million times. Oh. Never noticed this. Oh. And yeah, Culver City Lodge is right there beside this big Hare Krishna temple, big community there of Hare Krishnas. We go around, we eat. They're about to leave, and this one, you know, kind of Hare Krishna dude guy or whatever is like offering to give us a ride, all this kind of stuff. I'm like, you know what? I just feel it in my bones right now. I'm just going to go around the corner here. And this is like, you know, it's not, we didn't have lift or anything there. So this sure. is kind of like yeah. not live. 21 years it's, ago. Yeah, it's not like I'm in the valley, but it's like I knew that I'd have to figure out some weird way home. Yeah. And but I'm like, I need to go around the corner. I go around the corner. I'll see you guys later. I go around the corner and there's a group of youth there and they're all in like fancy dresses and suits and stuff. And they're, mm. they're all like 16 year olds. And they're actually holding the books of the game for which I went to Salt Lake City and met that girl that brought me to L.A. Right. Oh, OK. It's it's yeah, it's that's a whole other story. But but they're holding this product that I'm very familiar with. And have been for some time. I'm like, what the hell? Why are all these kids in like suits hanging outside the Masonic Lodge with, 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 with White Wolf books and what's going on? And I'm like, hey, are you, are you all part of like some uh, event here? They're like, oh, we're Dee Malay and Job's daughters. We're Masonic youth. I'm like, wow, you guys play that game? They're like, yeah. I'm like, wow, cool. I'm like, I've actually lo- – and I had been looking into Masonic Lodges already in right. L.A. Um, I hadn't discovered this one. Mm-hmm. And but it's, it's something I'd kind of been putting out there, and they're like, "Well, they're you know, you should go upstairs and talk to some of the brethren." Yeah, you know, they're up there right now, and I did, 
and and one of them gave me a ride home. And eight months later, I mean, not eight months later, uh, eight well, eight months later, I I was I was a master mason, and yeah. I was being you know installed as an officer of, of junior steward in my lodge, yeah. you know, and and that's where that all began. And I met I met some very important people um, mm-hmm. that have been part of my life ever since then. Mm-hmm. And eight years later, I I worked my way up the line at that lodge, uh, and was ma- installed as master of that lodge, and that yeah. was over 12 years ago now. And that was that to me though, that that's always stands out as one of the most profound stories of, of kind of coming to LA and asking for something to uplift me. And at the end of the night, arriving at a, a, a place and, and arriving at a, you know, community worldwide community yeah. at the doors that yeah. would, you know, to this day be a daily factor in my life that kind of shaped me to be who I am. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so sometimes your prayers, sometimes your prayers are answered, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Like with all things, there's ups and downs, and you know. Sure. You know, Freemasonry is an idea and a philosophy in a lot of ways. Then it's composed of people. You yeah. Know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Whenever you throw people in mix, you know, it's not it's not always, not always the perfect thing, but that's our philosophy: is that we're trying to make ourselves better. You know, yeah. throughout our lives. Yeah, I, well, let's let's. Uh, this is probably as good a place as any to sort of get into that. But I, I guess I want to let's let's start. This may take us on a detour, possibly, maybe not. But w- what was your connection or interest? What what was what was a connection or and or interest to Freemasonry? And then and then maybe talk about because because there's a misconception that some people have that that we can't talk about it at all if we don't want to, you know, I, I mean, reality is we, yes, there's certain things that are private, but I mean, an individual chooses whether or not they talk about it. There's no, there's no rule that yeah. you can't mention. This is something that you're part of, but right. so I'll be curious again, especially because you have had all the, the time in that you've had to get your take, but, but what was your connection to it? Did you have a, you have a family connection? Uh, I believe. I do. It's it's well it's interesting. Everyone there's a lot of misconceptions that you have to be born into. No, it's not a requirement. I didn't think I had one when I right. found out differently, but yeah. But yeah, but that's one of the they're like, oh, a lot of times what people ask me is, oh. oh, is your father a Mason? Well, the answer is yes, but I I didn't know that growing up. Yeah, you know. So yes, my father was a Mason. I didn't know that growing up. Um, when I was in college, I was digging through some stuff at my mom's one time and I found this mug and it said Scottish Rite Spring Formal and it had the double headed eagle. And I'd been researching these things already because as a teenager, I'd gotten into like alchemy, tarot, astrology, things of those nature. And if you study those things and, and yeah, their history, there's always Masons popping up exactly. as sort of advocates or, or people involved in this sort of thing. Basically, the Western mystery tradition. There's a lot know. of cross pollination. I mean, Better there's 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 that. there's some Masons who just like old dusty nerdy history, yeah. and talking philosophy, and then there's some people who are full blown wizards, and there's everybody in between. You know, there's yeah. that, that's so sort of the, the di- there's a dialectic between the academics and the uh, and the esoterics. You know, right. and some yeah. people are both, but but and, yeah. but, and, but and, there are people uh, who are like far on either end of the camp, and and that's a personal thing. It's not yeah. like this is how we right. do it here. It's like there may be anyway, but exactly. I'm, I'm getting ahead of the story. But so you're well, so it, your dad and, and 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 this is not the most sensitive segue I've ever done, but he had passed away. So how, how old were you when he uh, when he passed away? Well, I, I turned 12 like a couple months after he passed. OK, so you know? so, so and, your mom had his stuff is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. And th- and so, yeah, she had some stuff and it was, it was a, like a beer mug. I still have it. It's really cool. Yeah. But it didn't say masonry. I think it said Scottish Rite Spring Formal, but I recognized it as a Masonic symbol. And I said, I was like, mom, why do you have this Mason mug? You know? And she said, oh, that was your dad's. I go, what do you mean? It was my dad's. She's like, oh yeah, he was a Mason. And that was the thing we went to one year. Huh. And I was like, holy shit. And, then, <laughs> and that was one of the, I was one of these less informed people, right? Yeah. yeah Where I'm like, oh, I qualify now. Yeah, right, right, right. I'm, oh, I'm good. I'm, part of the line, you I'm know? a legacy. <laughs> you like know? it's a college I, fraternity, I, which it's I, not, obviously. But I mean, literally, though, it was one of those things where like, wow, okay, that 
you know, it, it, some things made sense. And like my dad was a pharmacist. Um, you know, I asked my mom about this and she said, well, it's just something that he wasn't involved with very much mm. once the kids were born and that sort of thing, which mm. a lot of people get involved and they kind of step away. Yeah. Um, but you know, my dad was ex he was captain in the army. Uh, he met my mom in Dallas. That's where they joined the Masons. I think that's where he joined the Masons in Dallas and the Scottish Rite, though. Mm -hmm. But it, it lets me know that he was at least a 32nd degree Mason because right. he but, had the, he was part of the Scottish Rite. You know? right. So he was more than just the, uh, he'd gone through all the degrees of Masonry. He'd joined the Scottish Rite. Yeah. yeah. His, his, I, his, his interest extended beyond just the cursory yeah. curiosity. He was, yeah. he was, he was very, very involved. Yeah. At least, at least when, you know, before I was born and whatnot and they moved back to Austin. But yeah, so that inspired me. Yeah. It inspired me a lot more. This was right before, you know what, this was right before I moved to London. So I remember going to, the, there's a big Scottish Rite building near the campus on UT in Austin. I went in there, talked to a guy. And it was one of those things where like this guy like got on the phone and he was like, hey, uh, because Scottish Rite, you have to join a Blue Lodge first. Yeah. Right. That's some people understand there's different bodies, but your Blue Lodge is where you go for the first three degrees, mm -hmm. become a Master Mason. Then you can join Scottish Rite, York Rite, Shriners, things like yeah. that. But I go to the Scottish Rite there because I'm not really, I'm not too keen on it. And he calls a local lodge and he's like, I've got a great guy right here and his daddy was a Mason and he wants to be a Mason. <laughs> you know, and, and I still have all these sort of misconceptions too. And, and I was like, you know, I was being, I was kind of a little, you know, I, I, uh, this is, this is the nineties. I was doing some kind of dumb shit sometimes and like, uh, wasn't on my best behavior. And part of me was sort of like, got a little scared that they're like, uh Oh, you know, you know <laughs> what are they going to do? They find out I smoked a joint once or something, you know, uh, <laughs> like, uh -huh. you know, what are they, how, you know, this is like, whatever. Sure. Uh, so I kind of put on hold. I didn't, and I knew I was going to London. So I went to London, came back, but that interest was still there. And so that is why, yeah, I had the, 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 the experience on the bus and going to that lodge. I was kind of prepped for it. Yeah. I'd kind of done my homework. Yeah. And you had already and, uh, been down the esoteric rabbit hole a bit where you were you were reading a lot of interesting philosophical things and histories and <laughs> and, and, yeah. and ways of like models of looking at the world. So you were already expanding like, your 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 you were expanding your consciousness, man. But 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 really. Yeah, but precisely. really no 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 pun. Precisely. Yeah. So yeah, then that you know, and, and like like you were saying, there's all kinds of people of all walks of life within masonry. Um I think sometimes – like I'm one of those people that came to it hoping for and expecting a lot of real cool kind of esoteric stuff. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes people are disappointed in that regard. Right. But it's because they're kind of not – they're not seeing the forest for the trees. They're not seeing what is there for them in that regard. And they right. want to come in and shake things up um, because there's, 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 there's a lot of people that are there just for kind of purely the fraternal aspects. Right. Of right. being part of a community and being part of this – People say I don't like when people say there's esoteric masons and non-esoteric masons because masonry is esoteric by right, definition. Exactly. Doesn't yeah. matter if you yeah, like yeah. Yeah. all this other stuff or not. It is yeah. like, and we're not uh, uh, we're not a secret society because I'm like we have websites. Our our names are on yeah, our right buildings. By, that's how you saw the building right, but right by the place where you had the had that great vegan right. meal at that at that. I've, yeah. I've been over there with with you. I've been over there many times myself. That's they they do right. a really good yeah. if you're in the mood for that kind of a vegan feed and very nice people. Yeah, precisely. well, but it's yeah. like a secret it's right there. By building. definition, it's secret. Yeah, yeah, it's secret. We don't we don't advertise who we are and wear rings that we can recognize each other by sure. and everyone can see. Sure. Uh but to me, it's been a great experience, you know, and people say, well, what's masonry? And, and, and all the good stuff is to me is in the, in the first degree where we talk about humanity, uh, as, as one family, mm -hmm. you know, people yeah. think, oh, well, masonry is just old white dudes or whatever. I've met people all over the world. I've gone to lodge in Hong Kong, um, the UK. I mean, yeah. I've gone to lodge in Costa Rica, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, it, it is, it is all over the world. It's all kinds of people of all walks of life. We're not a religion. We're lots of different perspectives. And I like that. I like that. I meet people that I wouldn't normally meet exactly. and that we use geometry. We use temple building as an allegory that unites us all. Mm -hmm. You know, all cultures have geometry. Um, all cultures have had some sort of temple building and architecture involved. And we can use the, uh, we can look, we can look to the stars and we can look to the seasons on, on the earth and we can see, uh, we can see uh, 
some emergent intelligence there. We we can see a harmony there, you know. Yeah. And and that that's what I find interesting. And that could line up with a lot of different spiritual paths and beliefs and whatnot. Sure. But there is this pervading universal wisdom that we sort of align under as Masons. It's a philosophical fraternity is the, the yeah. sort of the most succinct way that I mean yeah, I've heard you know plenty of people have said that, but that that particular super shorthand definition is it's actually more appropriate than you would imagine if you get deep down into the weeds. But but it's and as you said, some people there were times, uh, and especially if I mean people from all over the world listen, but I mean especially if you have an American experience as part of your your life. If you drive through the country, again, you see, like, when you come into a town, you'll see, like, one of those signs they have at the edge of town, welcome to Rockville, and it's got, you know, here's our Kiwanis and the Rotary Club and then the Mason Lodge, you know, and it's like one of those, just one of those, you know, civic, social type organizations, but it's very much oriented toward philosophy and and people who want to to under you know who are inclined a certain way basically but but the thing about it the thing that that i was most attracted to because i mean i was interested in in you know i mean i grew up with a difficult father relationship and no you know only child etc so i was interested in you know meeting some other other dudes you know getting to know some other you know friends or make some friends brother type people or, you know, mm-hmm. I need, I needed some, I need, I needed me some, uh, some Obi-Wan Kenobi types, you know, I needed a couple of, a couple of the old, yeah, yeah, yeah. old wizards to, to hang out with. And, and, um, so I, I found that, but I, I likewise have, you know, this isn't about me, so I won't go into detail now, but, but, and of course, you know, all this, but, you know, I also have, uh, you know, my, I, I had my pre existing philosophical interests and esoteric interests and, and, and likewise since childhood have sort of had that and have always read and studied those things. So I was always aware of the fraternity. Um, but then as I, when, when it finally came to pass, the thing that I discovered, and I'd heard this, I understood this intellectually, but I didn't have the experiential knowledge, which one of my very favorite, this is a paraphrase of a quote, which, you said these words many times in 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 uh, official capacities uh paraphrase that is is that masonry regards no man for his wealth or material position mm-hmm. and and so the fact of the matter i you know sometimes people would say well what's it like at your dinners i mean oh you know i mean people throw out all kinds of ideas you know some people it's like do y'all just get smashed do you just like is it a you know like a the total is it like the moose lodge you know, it's like, yeah, it's probably, it's not so much, you know, but, um, we, we don't get that far on their premises. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wine can be one person can donate wine for the whole room, which is wild. But, but, um, now they do it differently in New Zealand. They, they get smashed, you know, people are bringing bottles of whiskey. Oh, across, they have, yeah. Yeah. They, lots they, of they places have a they, 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 they have a bar in the lodge. So, um, the thing I was going to say really fast and throw it back to you is that, the regards no man for his wealth or material attainments or position, you know. So, at, at a, you know, people would ask, what's like, what's a dinner like? And you could be at a table that's set up for eight people. And so there's me, like a basically elapsed Southern Episcopalian and, you know, kind of, you know, independent filmmaker, producer. And again, it's like sort of feast or famine in my business, right? In our business. Mm-hmm. So, to my left, there might be a guy who's the CEO of a fairly prominent company uh, moving around the table. There might be a guy who's a custodian at the local elementary school. There might be somebody who is a semi-famous or famous writer, actor, director, musician, etc. There's mm-hmm. somebody who's a retired accountant. You know, there's a guy who worked in a factory for years um, in terms of sort of philosophical makeup there is everybody from from maybe a a a jew a muslim christians of many many stripes you know many kind of flavors of christians um and you might have and it's la so we might have the occasional voodoo priest or wizard you know yeah and that's fairly typical and and, and by the way 
the CEO might be the voodoo priest on the down. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, it's yeah. like the LA version of this is sort of the, you know, maybe extreme or super weird to somebody sounding to somebody version. But the bottom line is you get to know a lot of people for themselves. You get to know them at a really kind of core fundamental level. And that's without doing like a whole, you know, rambly take on the fraternity. For me, it's ultimately about, you know, we're focusing on these, as you were saying, like these fundamental things we have that frankly, very religious people would be offended to say it transcends religion. I say it's fundamental underneath. It's 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 before religion in a, in a lot of ways. It's a very, very core fundamental aspects of humanity that are more about, you know, moral rights and wrongs and behaviors, how you should treat yourself and others and move through the world and what are sort of generally acceptable principles on which we can all, on which all reasonable people can agree. And for me, that's, that's, that's sort of my bad summary of it. But, but you specifically, again, we're in the Scottish right together um, which is for people who like more dusty books and more, yeah. more spec, more yeah. history or more, you know, rel- you know, historical fiction or more mythology and, and to relate those one to the other, to the other, to the other, and find the common threads between all of those. Right. So it just increases your empathy and mm-hmm. your understanding is this. So for me, that's something because you are one of the most empathic people I, I know, what does it give you? What does what does masonry, you know, and your and your and your related pursuits? Maybe it's a lot of different things. So specifically masonry, though. What do these sorts of things give you in your life? Um. Well, a you know, masonry is an initiatory process, and every initiation should have a profound impact upon you. And I can always look back to an experience that I had in the first degree that really changed my attitude uh, in a lot of ways, you know, mm-hmm. where it was like a click for me yeah. and it kind of went, oh, OK, like like ritual is designed to put you into a space that's not your normal situation so that you can absorb experience and information and wisdom in, in a different process. You know, mm-hmm. just like seeing a play, you have a vicarious experience and you can you can kind of like you said empathize sympathize vicariously through that. Well, in the ritual, you're experiencing yourself, and it, and it's meant to transform you. You know, yeah. some things some things may instantly happen. Some things are a process. I can always look back on though as as a as something that, that where I can remember. Yes, that that lesson right there. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. And the, the rituals are packed full of stuff like that. Right. And. When you expand into the, the Scottish Rite, you know, we have 29 degrees. You know, it's the span history and mythology. And I, within the Scottish Rite, we've often talked about how, like, they didn't have a, a – you couldn't get a degree in comparative religion right. in 1902, right? right. But you could be, be in the Scottish Rite and basically get what amounted yeah. to that. Right. And, you know, I have, I, I'm, I'm an old-school kind of theater kid, you know? There are theatrical elements to masonry, right? Particularly the Scottish Rite. Exactly. We dress up in in in, in, in and costumes sets and we portray characters and yeah, from both from both history and mythology. Yeah, and we we tell stories and there's sword fights, all kinds of shit. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. There's little stage combat sometimes. Honestly, yeah, when you see the Shriners who are masons driving around their little uh, yeah cars and dressing up like clowns and all this kind of stuff. I think a lot of us that are Masons enjoy it as a community and, and venue to do things like that, to yeah. enjoy those theatrical yeah. aspects. And the guys who are normally, like you said, like a barber or someone that doesn't have a, a, a degree in theater or who doesn't work in entertainment or doesn't yeah. like it's, it's on one hand, it's, it's, it's kind of uh it's like a new thing. It's like a whole, wow, I've never done anything that I've never worn a costume before. Oh, mm-hmm. shuck. So fun. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and that's good. Yeah, it's it, yeah. and it's frustrating for someone though like me that is a theater kid when it's try, you're trying to like <laughs> describe you, what blocking is to people. It's like no, like yeah. don't turn your back on the audience when you're speaking, like these sort of things. Exactly. But nonetheless, it's a lot of it's a lot of fun in yeah. that regard, yeah. and it's and it's and honestly, it's kind of it's kind of dorky in a lot of ways 
like us dressing up in goofy costumes and stuff like sure. that. But in other ways, it's it's kind of on point and there's a history behind it. Right. And there's a seriousness to it. And we're telling deep stories. And so as someone who, if anything, is like, what do you do? Why are you involved in entertainment? Well, I like stories and I like storytelling and there's power in storytelling. And I want to tell powerful stories. I want to tell stories that have an impact. And by belonging to something like Masonry, to the Scottish Rite, we're telling stories and we're giving uh, new members experiences as part of those narratives that that hopefully will be transformative. That will hopefully fulfill the purpose of us having all these stories and experiences so we can reflect upon our lives and apply these lessons to our lives Yeah, and go from, you know— the rough ashlar stone, which is pulled out of the quarry and is rough and has, you know, can't be used for anything other than just a stone and perfecting that through the application of science and different processes to become a cornerstone to a magnificent building, yeah. cathedral, artifice, you know, yeah. being, yeah. being, being, the, that's, that's one of our chief yeah. symbols and allegories. Yeah, and there's a lot of different ways which we portray that, and teach the lessons of it. So there's there's a lot of deep diving you can do on that. And one thing that I appreciate too is that in masonry should be the real deal, and that I can say I went through, if not the same, a very similar experience as people did 300 years ago yeah. with these initiations. Yeah. You know, of course, yeah. things have changed and, and whatnot, but like more or less, like I had the same initiatory experience as. Voltaire, that's Benjamin. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, but also Washington, like, yeah. Yeah. But also like John Coltrane, all sorts of people that yeah. have been Mason. Yeah. You can sit there and go like all these artists, all these influential people, good or bad. You can at least, you can still say I had the same experience with them. Yeah. What I took away is all personal, but you know, this isn't, this isn't some fly by night thing. This isn't something someone made up. Yeah. Five months ago. Yeah. This is something that's been going on. I, I went to London in 2017 and went to lodge there, went to lodge in Glossbury, England. But that was like the 300th anniversary for the founding of the Grand Lodge of England. Yeah. That was really cool. Yeah, no doubt. Well, and especially Um, in a world where everything is, you know, I mean, we have disposable culture and we were, you were, you were, you were, you were on about this earlier about, you know, the, the, the kids with their text messages, basically. And it's like, in a world where, you know, it's – what are we up to, 256 characters on Twitter? To be able to be part of something that has actual history and 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 relevance in the formation of the modern world and acted uh, – uh, you know, people who shared within that were actively involved in, in, in shaping the modern world for better and worse – but that it continues, you know, there's a continuity. It, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing to be able to be part of something like that. And, uh, and we've, you know, again, there'll be people who will wish we would keep talking about this and people who are ready for us to move on as we often have, I could easily talk about philosophical type things, uh, with you for hours, but in the interest of making this a show for everybody, let's talk about your career a bit because, I've had a lot of entertainment folk on this show and from every sort of walk of life, every angle on this, writers, directors, actors, producers, and some craftspeople. I've had all kinds of people. It, this show has a has had a bit of an entertainment focus. It's not exclusive to that, but that's been sort of the focus. When you moved out here, and again, you came for a girl, found a, a profession in masonry, and avocation and then in terms of your career you know again you mentioned theater theater degree directing theater from from texas so was the plan what was the plan creatively i mean was it all about the girl at the time or was it was there a bigger drawing something bigger drawing you out here you know i would say that it's funny because like some of my friends back home in austin Basically, I always said, like, yeah, you, you were obviously the guy that was going to move to Hollywood, right? I literally grew up on a street called Hollywood Avenue. So, okay. you know, if, if you get my pet or my, you know, if, if, you know, they say, like, what's your uh, your soap opera name? It's, it's oh. your dog, your first pet, and the street you grew up on. Well, my, my soap opera name is, is Scotty Hollywood. 
Nice. You know, that's the street I grew up on in East Austin. You know, that's awesome. Nice. <laughs> that sort of thing. And in a way, it was destiny. I came, I, I came here knowing that you know I have a degree in directing, right? Mm-hmm. In, in high school, this is one of the this is going back to Austin. This is one of the fortunate things you can do in Austin. You can go to like a liberal arts school where you get a great educa- public education of, you know, all the history and English and everything in between. But I was in, you know, every year in the spring, that was my elective jazz band. That was the end of the day. It was jazz band. Okay. I learned how to like, and we we traveled around and like. We, you know, I was in the jazz band, I was in the art programs. Mm-hmm. I, I, I remember out of like pragmatism, I remember we had to read the crucible when, and I was a, a junior and I saw that, I don't think they lined it up this way, but they were having auditions for the crucible. Oh. And I was like, I'm just going to audition for this play. So I reading this book or whatever. And, uh, I got into the play and I got to play this, uh, uh kind of, you know, evangelical, were they Puritans, you know, uh, yeah. a minister, okay. you know, scared of the devil. Yeah, yeah, and like, yeah. I got the bug. I was like, this is awesome. Like, I like acting. This is a lot of fun, you know, mm-hmm. like, uh, and, and ever since, the, yeah, I basically became a theater kid then. And then when going to college, it was like, do I want to get an art degree, music degree, theater degree? And I felt that like, you know, I was very much kind of cinephile then too, you know, watching uh, Hong Kong films and then mm-hmm. that sort of stuff, like all the PBS stuff. And and just loving movies and narratives, so I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go to th- get my degree in theater, and I'm gonna go the directing route. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I still I still like acting. I still do to this day. I was involved in a bunch of plays, but I got my degree in directing because ultimately that I felt set me up as a producer. You know, yeah. having a, a, a knowing what the big picture is, knowing what all the different moving parts of a production are, yeah, knowing what costume design is, the, the music score, the behind the scenes stuff, lighting, all those things. Uh, I thought it was great for me to ultimately become a producer because directors have to be very hyper focused. I realized too, though. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I'm more about like, what are all the moving parts here, and how do we keep all this moving? In a lot of ways. So I'd moved from Austin. I'd moved to London. I actually tried to like audition for things in London and, and failed miserably. <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, lots. Nights wandering around Soho, depressed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but coming here, coming here, here. I mean, I was telling myself it was for the girl, but I also knew deep down, like this is the kind of city that I want to go to, and this is the kind of city that I can thrive in. Um, this is going to be cool, you know, Hollywood, the the film industry, all these sort of things. But I came here and was actually had a reaction that I think a lot of people have that come from a smaller place. Uh, Oh, it's the big city. People here are rude. No one's friendly. I can't mm-hmm. walk. In Austin, mm-hmm. you can walk down the street, or at least you used to be able to yeah. walk down Guadalupe Street, and 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 you know the girl walking up to you smiles at you, and you yeah. smile back. You say hey, and you keep walking. Sure, like you sure. don't. You're not afraid of them. But that's one thing my my high school theater teacher told us. He had just come fresh from like Broadway in New York, and he's like, when you live in the big city, you have your city face, and you walk mm-hmm. down the street. Yeah. You, you don't have any expression and you don't look people in the eye and people walk up to you and you just keep walking. You just step out of the mm-hmm. way and you don't acknowledge them. And that's what I mean by London prepped me for that. Yeah. London prepped me yeah. for life in the big city, which I understand now when you're walking through, you know, when you're do, walking down Wilshire Boulevard and there's a million people and people walk, you know, who knows what's going on. People walking up trying to get your attention or want something from you generally aren't people you want to talk to on the streets. Usually, it's all the random. Usually, yeah. 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 So you take on a big city mentality, but I came here coming from Austin in a very different culture and was met by that and had that sort of, you know, I don't like this sort of vibe and like, and, and going to some auditions or trying to dip my toe into being an actor or whatnot. Uh, and, and quickly realizing, you know, I'm, I'm one of 50 six foot tall blonde dudes and glasses in the room <laughs> waiting for this audition type of yeah. shit. Yeah. I, I, I steered clear of that for a while, actually. And and I got a job in a back hair store, and it was down the street from this one university, of which I eventually – at the same time all this happened, though, it kind of lined up. I joined the Masons. I got involved in some really kind of cool, unique spiritual groups and in the overall kind of Southern California community in that way. And I kind of told myself, you know what? I'm going to spend four years – doing this because I'd co- I'd now come into some communities mm-hmm. and people that were very much sort of elder statesmen in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah. 
I was having all these interesting, like, like very quickening experiences of like buying a book that was cool and learning a lot from it. And then meeting that author yeah. months later. Yeah. Tur- them, turns you know, out like that they're like Japan, a good but- friend and colleague of some of your, some of your, your consulting wizards. Yeah, exactly. And suddenly I'm in Topanga, like in weird tantric camps with these people or something, or like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'm in Long Beach, uh, <laughs> like hanging out. Just, just like it, yeah. it, it, it very much, I knew deep down, like, here's a good time to kind of step back from being an actor or all this kind of stuff. I got my master's degree in counseling psychology. And, but once I did that, I realized that I really like being on set. I right. really like being part of the creative process. And I also realized that I didn't have the emotional fortitude to basically sit in a chair and have people open up all their darkest things on me all day long either. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, so that was around like 2004, 2005. And that was a whole different time too, then too, because we didn't have such proliferation of social media. You know, no, it was, still, like it was still early day. days. Yeah. We, yeah, we, yeah, we met it. We yeah. met offline. Yeah, you know, but and I miss uh, those days. Yeah. I really miss those days. Yeah, I, I miss the infancy years of social media when it wasn't something you had to do every day, all day long, and people were more creative, and there was more. This felt like more of a community, and there felt like more genuine creativity going on. I'd got my, I'd, I'd earned my master's in counseling psychology. Realized I didn't want to go that path. Happy I had a master's, but then decided to get my foot back in the door of the entertainment industry. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And like many people in LA, that starts at central casting, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, like you're like, well, how do I do this? How do I start getting auditions? And you see that there's ample work basically doing background work. Yeah. So for, so for, for two or three years there, I was like, that was sort of my bread and butter. Mm-hmm. It, it was um, it was interesting because I got to be on sets for major films and oftentimes featured. Right. You know, I got to, I got to be in Captain America. Like, you know, um, you can see me in one of those kind of final scenes. I got I was in some transfers. I got to be dressed up in you know, I, I grew a red mustache one time, knowing that they were casting for Alice in Wonderland, and got a call one day after I sent them a picture of me in a monocle and top hat with my mustache. And the very next day, the, the, the casting person, because I, I was submitting for this role in Alice in Wonderland, and the very next day, get the call. You've been selected. <laughs> Tim <laughs> wants you in the movie. And it's like, yeah. And like, Sweet. you know, and you, and you show up at four in the morning at what was, was you know, then Culver Studios. And you're, well, you, you know, I, I don't know if people know the process for things like this, but in some, in these sort of high end period pieces, or whatever, you have to go to a, you have to go to a costume fitting, you know, and, yeah. and you go in and, um, gosh, I can't remember her name, but she literally won the Oscar for this. And I'm in oh, there right, and they're right. like, what? his regular she, costume she's designer. Like, like, what's that? Uh, Burton's regular costume designer. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, her name also. Um, it's not Atwood. It's, um, is it Colleen Atwood? It's not Colleen Atwood. No, she's an author, right? She wrote, uh, the, uh, Oh, did she? <laughs> yeah. We, well, well, it's, I, we we have the internet. Someone can can side yeah, if they wish, but, but it's calling anyway. Like she, I, I recognize her. Like she walks up. Her helpers are sitting there, like putting, uh, you know, uh, like sort of a uh, Elizabethan garb up to me. And she walks up. She's like, "No, no, put him in the burgundy." I was like, mm, "Yes," because nice. <laughs> I like burgundy. So, like, yeah, I got this, I got the words amazing, you know, thousand dollar outfit and, oh, and yeah, with a yeah. big and all, just stuff like that was a lot of fun. You know, I got to be a British soldier in Pirates of the Caribbean, and I got that role because I was in the marching band in high school, and they basically bring like 200 people into a auditorium and be like, all right, you know, we have a guy who's a British drill master, and he's, he's he knows how soldiers marched, and, you know, you guys have 30 minutes to learn this marching drill, and we're mm-hmm. going to pick 12. Okay. You know? And you and, could do that. You had that skill set. And I could go boom. I could. I, I knew how to do that with a, a big steel drum tap, you know, over my shoulders. So just right. like with a gun, I knew how to freezey turn, bit, 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 all kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I got to be uh, at, as, at the Disneyland Ranch, and I got to be in this, this big castle where they're hanging pirates, and I'm a British soldier, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Just cool stuff like yeah. that. But um, but you really get to see how the how the how the donuts are made at a yeah. at, at the biggest level. 
So the That's observational fine. benefit, I always say, you know, you, you know that I used to teach producing for years between projects and plus just also, you know, meet young, meet young filmmakers now that I'm an old one. And, you know, what's, what's your best piece of advice? Best piece, best piece of, of advice is whenever you graduate or start, you know, get a job on set. As long as yeah. you, you, you want to be able to see this set, ideally you want to be on this set <laughs> yes. doing something Yes, but 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 you but but be get there, get there, yeah. and eyes and ears wide open and mouth shut, unless that's your job in that moment, you know. So just be there and soak it up by osmosis. I because exactly. you know that my first like produce writing, producing, directing was always the goal, but the first twelve years I was really on the technical side. I was on set sound, and then mm-hmm. later I was a picture editor. And then there was a little bit of overlap for a few years after I moved to LA, you know, those things paid the bills while I worked on the other. But I mean, I learned so much from the, you know, 70, 80, like indie movies, a few big ones, but you know, a lot of indie mm-hmm. movies, movies of the week back in the day, all these things. I just, I was, I worked, I was swinging a boom or I was recording the dialogue. You know, I learned so much that prepared me to produce and to write, you know. Because I was in the sound department, I was like listing incredibly carefully, studying the lines. It's just, you have to know the line. If, you, if you're the guy swinging the mic, you have to know the lines as well as the actors because you have to anticipate when you swing exactly. the mic over to the next guy who's gonna speak, right? Yeah. Just the things like that. Yeah. So, so it's like you were incredibly keyed in on the action and the dialogue. Yes. And so, like, I just, I, I, I did that for ten years. <laughs> I yeah. did that for like 250, 300 days a year for ten years. You know, 12, 14 hours a day. Yeah. So, so I just, I soaked up so much stuff. So I tell any of these kids, get a job on a set. Right. If you want to do that, something on that set yourself one day, b- become the lowest guy or gal on the totem pole, but get your butt on there. So, so background work is amazing because you get to see, again, like you said, on some, a lot of things you're, I mean, you're going through the full works, you know, the hair, makeup, wardrobe, depending mm-hmm. on what the thing is. You know, get a prosthetic you know, mask, you know, get a, get a, get a fake this or that. And yeah. so you're seeing like, oh, this is the whole process of what the acting thing is about at this high yeah. end level. Right. You know, well, it, it was interesting because one of the first things I did, one of the first jobs I had after, you know, when I was like, I'm going to get back into the entertainment industry was I was a PA though. And I was a PA on a horror film that was also a reality show. It was a reality. It was a reality show about all these reality people from all these other shows who came together to make a real movie, and it, it was awful. <laughs> and I don't think anyone saw it. It was called The Scorned. Okay. Um, but I was on the movie end of it, right? Uh-huh. So I was. It, it was three different productions going on at once. It was the actual film getting made, but then it was also the show being made. Huh? So there are kind of like multiple units here. Yeah. But I was a P for the film part. Which yeah. means, you know, I was, and this is us like way out in Calabasas area on top of a hill where it's obvious a house where they've done all these porn shoots or something like that. Right. Um, but, you know, this big kind of mansion y swimming pool place. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, first day, it's like, all right, you're a PA. Well, you're, you're driving the, and this was non use. It flipped the union, but it was non union. So they're pulling all sorts of crap at right. first, which was like, hey, let's get this guy who's completely green to drive the van up and down the mountain every day with all the actors in it wow. and, and drive the talent around, which is kind of weird. Cause I made friends with these sort of like who were then famous reality. Yeah. Trucks, you know, yeah. I mean, who was that guy? Johnny Fairplay was one of the cast yeah, members. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, there, there were a lot of people that were complete nightmares on that set. And, <laughs> and it was, uh, that was a learning experience, but at that kind of juncture, it was like, I saw that like, I could like go to PA route yeah. Or I can go the background route. Uh, I'm going to go the background route, right? Yeah. If I'm going to be making pennies, basically, but I'm going to be on set yeah. And yeah. as part of productions, yeah. I'd rather, like, you know, be the guy that gets – because, you know, if you're a PA, what sucks is, like, as a PA, you know, you're learning a lot of things. You're learning all the elements of production because you're doing them in many ways. But you're also kind of like you're, – you're on a low end of the totem pole. You know, yeah. as background, you're on a low end of the totem pole, too. But, like, like PAs eat last, you know, at right. least a background, I can go through the food line and not be the last freaking guy that eats. You know, yeah. um, you know, you're 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 sitting for a lot of time. You can be on your computer. You can write your script between yeah. 
the three hours you sit on set sometimes. Right. I've sat on, I, I, you know, I sat for eight hours one time in holding, you know, and read a book, but that was cool. But like you said, get on set. Yeah. You know, totally. There's, there's nothing like just being there. Yeah. You know, there was a, a, I was on entourage and true blood for almost all the seasons. Right. Right. I got to see these whole arcs of stories. It was really cool. You yeah. know, I got, got to see all these, these, all the, all the stars behind the scenes and sure. what they're like. And, and just really cool moments and things like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. But ultimately that, like, like some things in my life though, um, it's like a random phone call that changes your life. Right. Yeah. So for me, how I, and, and all, and all this was me observing things being like, yeah, I really want to be a player here. I want to like be one that's helping make this stuff happen as right. opposed to whatnot. How, but you know, how do you do that? That's, that's a big question. It's not such a clear path as like, you know, becoming like a good camera guy where you become the assistant and then sure, you become the sure. thing. You know, yeah, the, the, the technical trades and crafts, there's like an yeah. apprentice type of a program. I mean, it's still an apprenticeship business in yeah. so many ways. So, yeah, that's how that's if you want to you want to become, you know, the cameraman or camera woman. Well, you you can either go up through the lighting department or the camera department, <laughs> but you yeah. don't parachute yeah. in from nowhere and just. Yeah. Because you have a GoPro, you don't walk on a movie set and become a cinematographer. It's not sure. equivalency, you know. Exactly. Um, but with me, there's this whole, whole there's this whole kind of weird story that goes kind of along with this. But um, long story short, let's just let's just say that I had basically put it out there to anyone that was listening or the universe that you know I wanted to, I w- I wanted to basically be brought into the kingdoms of uh, producers who would hire me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I got this call the blue one day. Cause it's, so this is like 2009, right? This is, which unfortunately I think a new era that we're going into now, uh, these are some slim times again, you know, the, the, con- the economy was a wreck. Um, there wasn't many things in production. I was at sort of a, a low end place again. And I got a call from, from this guy I didn't even know, Who's like, hey, I'm a producer. That's the first thing he says. Yeah. I'm a producer, and uh, our lead actor dropped out. He said you'd be a good fill-in. This is for the San Francisco Fringe Festival, and we would bring you up there and put you up and feed you for two weeks, and you'd perform for two weeks. Okay. I was like, holy cow. Sounds, sounds amazing. Sounds awesome. And this is the kind of thing that can happen in L.A., in Hollywood. Yeah. There's, there's boundless opportunity here. So this is a guy that I met at something at a castle in the Hollywood Hills and like literally met once. And I As think you do. I've, like, as you do. What's that? Yeah. As you do. Yeah. yeah. And literally I'd met him once. I don't, I think I've, I've, I've interacted with this person one other time since then. But mm-hmm. he's like, I'm like, who told you this? Oh, this guy, so-and-so. I'm like, that guy, I met the guy once. All right, yeah, cool. Yeah. Sweet. Um, and, uh, you know, I should send the guy a Christmas present every year because, <laughs> yeah, because I, I, uh, well, actually that, that has, I went to San Francisco, I did it and it really uplifted my spirits. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I'm on a new trajectory here. Like it's happening. Like I literally a producer called me. Well, the funny thing is I get back from San Francisco, I book some work. I think it was on like private practice or something. So I'm sitting there in like medical scrubs, blah, blah, blah on yeah. set. And I get another call and it's from, um, it's from these ladies that, the, uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's a store. Basically it's a witch shop on, in Hollywood. No longer and, here. Can you see and, my camera? Yep, yep. So I, I, yeah, I have I have an essential oil in the bottle from Pan Pipes Magical Marketplace. May they yes. rest in peace. They have closed. Yes, but I but I yeah. keep the, I keep the bottle. I've refilled it with different oils because the oil that they made for me is long gone. Sadly, there you go. But yeah, no, but, but it was related yeah. to that reality show at Pan Pipes, right? Yeah, there was there was a, a reality show in the works and. Uh, essentially there was these two ladies, they were a couple, they ran this shop and they call me and they're like, Hey, there's these producers for reality. And they want to do a, a, a show, a pilot about our store. And they want us to be like the in-house people, but then they want to have like a field team and they want to hire actors for it. And we told them that we won't work with anyone else, but Chris Sanders, because he's yeah. the real deal. Like he's got a foot in both worlds. He understands this. Yeah. He can handle it and not make it stupid or, yeah. or cheesy yeah. and he could speak with you know uh, authority and, and informed yeah. ability yeah. and i was like great yeah. and made a pilot and i was like the male lead of it yeah yeah <laughs> and yeah. i recruited i recruited another friend of mine who was like a, a, a you know go-go dancer by night 
you know, tarot reader by day, you know, looks cool in leather pants to be like my, my partner in the field team. And we did this whole, and it, and it, once again, it was like, you know, reality TV producers trying to make a show about something that doesn't actually exist, you yeah. know, like, yeah, yeah. where's the conflict? Of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, and treating, so that, that's bad. That's bad. Reality TV. Producer. Yeah. Uh, treating people on very spiritual paths. Like it's some sort of like contest or, yeah. or, or, you know, like weird cop show or whatever. Um, but I, you know, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm a hungry actor and I'm like, I'll do this. Yeah. But through yeah. it, I met the executive producer, uh, Mark Phillips of Mark Phillips, uh, film and television who he'd done like true tales of the highway patrol and through his conversations. And it's funny, we were in my Masonic lodge that I brought him to, to show him like, Hey, this is part of my world. And we're sitting in there and he's like, you know, there is a show I'm trying to get off the ground. Yeah. It's called my ghost story. It's about people telling true tales of their paranormal experiences. There's always video or audio or visuals, photographs involved. He goes, I think you would be a great producer on this. And you're sitting in that library, which I mean, like any good ghost story usually takes place in a, like a gorgeous library. Yeah, or a something. study, something like that. That's that's a perfect environment. I can imagine you sitting there talking to to Mark yeah. uh, in this environment. Yeah. So, please, sorry, please continue. I just a uh, little 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 color well, for people. Well, he said that, and I said I I agree. Yes, I would be. I'd be great. Yeah. And uh, you know, two months later, there I was, and I was I you know I was my first production job, and you know I had to learn a lot of things and like. I, and then I, I learned what it was like to be a, a TV producer and like yeah. the many hours she put in. And I learned why people in TV drink by this. <laughs> like I never, I never poured myself one. Like I don't like to drink alone. And after three weeks of trying to like, you know, squeeze a camel through the eye of the needle or whatever, uh, it was like, oh, yeah, I go home and I pour myself one because, you know, it was a lot of stress. Like TV. That's so why I tell people TV, you're under the gun. You're under the gun yeah. of the network. Yeah. It's like Monday yeah. starts and then Friday you got to deliver something. Mm-hmm. You know, but a uh, long story short, though, uh, I gave them probably half their content for the first season. The first season went on to be their number one show uh, to this day. It was a show on bio called My Ghost Story, and it got rebranded as My Ghost Story Caught on Camera. Yeah. And uh, it, it kind of kicked off that wave of those shows. I mean, it's sort of the one that was the giant breakout hit. And then we've yeah. had a bazillion paranormal yeah. type shows, investigative type shows since. But, uh, but that one made that, that was, that was, I mean, some people will realize, some people will say like, I don't even have to explain it. I'm just saying there yeah. might be people who missed it. It was before their time, but it was, a, it was a big, it was a milestone of, of sorts. And it definitely launched you because I mean, we were, you know, I was still, you know, scrappy, scrappy film producer and, you know, I've added TV to my portfolio, but uh, in other capacities, not reality so much. I've done some documentary type type things, but but yeah. So me as like a producer and like a parallel thing, I mean, a I was so excited when you got that gig, and likewise, I'm like, yes, of course, you, yeah, you are the perfect person. You got one foot in the esoteric camp and one foot in the here's how we make the donuts production sausage camp. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, and it felt really good. And I've, I've rode that wave a number of times. And yeah, we, we, we told, I tell people like there's shows I've worked on since then that were so much less complicated and so much less demanding because on that show we had five stories per episode. We had two storytellers per story. We had to have some sort of audio, visual, video evidence. Right. There's a lot of pieces in play, you know, as a producer and you know, all the, and you're telling stories, you're telling six minutes of television. Yeah. You have to like all the, you know, all the things people don't understand about it, about like, no, you have to lock down agreements. You have to cover your ass. Yeah. You have to make sure that library that this ghost story films in that we want to film part of the B-roll in signs off on all this shit before right. we fly people out and book them in hotels and, 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 and have them prep to tell their story on a soundstage and whatnot. Yeah. And so there's all these little pieces to that that you learn. And it was very it was very good. And that was my bread and butter for a number of years. We had numerous seasons we told almost 900 stories. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And that's two people per story too. So like literally yeah, almost 2000 people yeah. got to speak their voice and tell their stories. And it wasn't an investigative show. It wasn't ghost hunters. Right. It wasn't ghost right. hunters. It wasn't trying to prove anything. And we didn't have to like make up all this stuff. Yeah. You know, we didn't have to like craft this like 
corny Scooby Doo adventure every time. It's like, no, bring these people in, yeah. have them tell their stories. It's their build, story. You know, yeah. My ghost story. story. It's right there in the title. Precisely. It's right yeah. there. So very high concept. The interesting thing is I'd never con- I mean, I was I was interested in the paranormal. I'd studied the paranormal, but the paranormal community in America and across the world is a lot of them are very much that's their thing. They're yeah. into ghosts. Yeah. That's it. Um, right. That that was never my niche, but I mean, it is as a producer now. You know, to yeah. me, there's a, it's a much bigger world than just ghosts out there. Sure. But um, from that, I gained a really extensive network in the paranormal community in America and across the world. You know, and I'd be able to t- I'd be able to take that to other shows. And in fact, that's something I took to this to this show that um, we were casting for just a couple months ago. You yeah. know, yeah. I was able to like pull out my Rolodex again. And that show was actually a much bigger umbrella, which I was happy about because it, it involved a lot of different things. But no, that that show was great. I'm really I was really happy to do that. From that, like I learned so much just about TV production and all yeah. the logistics in general. You know. And that uh, that was eleven years ago. So yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's been a long, weird road since then. You know, yeah. which includes like you and I producing television for Chinese yeah. television. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, things. Like yeah, I got a. Uh, I won't go into the long story here, but but I, I got a. I, I ended up being put in the. You know, I, I got the gig to produce and be the U.S. executive producer for a a season of Chinese television of a of a long running top um, like interview show writers, directors, actors, producers in front of a huge, you know, huge uh, rear projection screen studio audience. Uh, in our case, I think we had, do we have nine cameras or 11? It seems like it was a prime number, but, but yeah. So when, when I, when that went from a concept to real, you're the first person I called. I mean, you know, I was like, well, I need you on this. <laughs> Because you were my friend who had all the, you know, we, we had our other history and, and involved in several indie film projects previously. So we had a working history as well as being buddies. But I'm like, yeah, you, you've, you've become my TV guy. So come on. Yeah. <laughs> and you were able to, you know, between the two, I mean, we were probably, we were probably all 50, 50, I guess on that. But as far as, as far as like the, the crew we pulled in and things like that, but that was a real collaborative. Yeah. You and I, yeah, man, driving around. Tour and sound stages, like it, most of the yep. studio lots around town, a yep. bunch of weirdo stages that you've never heard of and everything in between, yeah. you know, and getting that done. But, um, but it's, it's been, cool. it's, it, it was cool, you know, and, uh, the tales are what they are, but as far as, you know, I mean, we've had a great chat and it's, it's a, it, it's, it's a good one. It's a long one. So I don't want to keep you too much longer, but you know, that's, that's been the world. Obviously, um, we'll probably have to do multiple rounds of these cause there's so much we can talk about, but as far as, you know, maybe, maybe this is worth a little dip back toward the, uh, the COVID post COVID quarantine world. Um, in terms of personally, professionally moving toward the future, what do you sort of see? How do you see yourself? You know, um, do you, do you, do you see yourself changing again? Has, has this given you added reflection time about new career paths or new insights or am I being a little dramatic or getting ahead of, ahead of the horse here? You know, is it too early to be sort of that philosophical or are you, I, I think, you I know, imagine you are to some part of your, I imagine some part of you is having these thoughts cause you can't help yourself. So I'm curious what that part of you is saying. Well, regarding the the future of the world and, and my involvement in it, in a you know, what is in a, a you know this pandemic world that we don't know what it's going to be like three months from now, let alone three weeks in some ways. Yeah, I am just trying to take it kind of one day at a time. I also am trying to you know plan for the future and and think if like a lot of these conditions set in and become the new norm, what then, right? So. I am fortunate to to know a lot of people that have done a lot of streaming stuff. Yeah, and this is this is where I'm kind of it's that double edged sword now. Of we have all these capacities, we have Zoom, we have Twitch, all these kind of things. We can put information online, and one of the pitfalls that I'm trying not to find you know, fall into is just sort of like needless 
expenditure of time and energy for things don't amount to much at all. Yeah. Like, you know, arguing online or just like playing video games all day, things sure. like that. Yeah. Um, so it has kind of opened up, uh, my desires, inclinations to do things like this, you know, uh, this is, this is, I think this is my first major podcast appearance. Oh, you know? very nice. I, very but nice. I'm enjoying this. You know, these are things yeah. we can do now when, if yeah. we're sitting up all day and, and even if we weren't, you know, I would really want to be doing this, but, yeah. uh, more people are going to be listening to content like this now, yeah. you know, obviously, um, I'm, I'm hoping to, you know, I've been, I've been, it's funny because, uh, you know, I have a number of irons in the fire, you know, as do you, as do all of us, you know, who are trying to get various projects off the ground. I'm, I'm hoping four months from now, things can be actually boots on the ground production, you know, mm -hmm. with various things, but it's, it's also a time to, you know, it, it's funny. Like I've been trying to get a, I want to, I want to, I've been trying forever to have a D and D, you know, I played D and D as a kid and I've been trying forever to have a D and D game that's via Twitch or zoom or whatever that's called wizards with wizards. And it's where like, uh, authors of these esoteric, you know, books yeah. and, and self-proclaimed wizards and witches and all this kind of stuff come together and play a D and D game where we're playing wizards, right. <laughs> exclusively. And, and like, I've been trying to do that with like friends of mine. I I say, it's, ba it's basically your game. You just wanted to make a show out of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's, <laughs> it's like, your it's actual like, crew. Just put a camera yeah, on it. Yeah. It's like people I know that I, I, that I genuinely want to play yeah. D&D with, but I was like, well, what if we just do if it's all the like spellcasting wizard classes and that's kind of our spin on it <laughs> and that'll be a lot of fun. And man, I'm, I'm telling you, you know, that that's that's harder than than getting a movie off the ground. <laughs> but with oh, with the uh, get, getting a uh, bunch of would be game. wizards to agree. Yeah, yeah, getting a feel like, you know, uh, but now that, you know, a lot of people are home more and like those conversations have started again. It's like, yeah. okay, guys, let's do this. Yeah. But because it's, it's, it's like, I, I don't want to do it, we just do it a couple of times. I wanted to do it yeah. where, you know, this is something people tune in for, you know, and like, and I'm, I'm actually being, I wouldn't say I'm being hypocritical, but honestly, like, I'm not a person that, uh, like I'm saying, like, I've tried to dial down my online consumption. I honestly don't listen to a lot of podcasts or sure. watch a lot of like things on Twitch or things of that nature. But I know now I'm going to be doing more of that more. Yeah. And, and, uh, just cause before it's kind of like, you know, you live in a big city like LA, there's a lot of things going on. Once again, I'm, I'm gregarious. I like to get out there and be mixing it up and not sitting in front of a screen all the time, yeah. you know? So one of those big questions is how do I balance all that now? And part of that is doing things like this where it's a very specific, you know, like we're, creating good content right now yeah you know it's not just kind of like twiddling of thumbs you know or it's not just kind of like passive you know whatnot like i like i don't watch a lot of sports i don't necessarily watch people play D, &D online mm -hmm. i don't understand mm -hmm. like being a spectator doesn't right thrill me too much you know yeah. Yeah. get much out of it you know but being a participant mm -hmm. i do yeah. So that's what I want to yeah. be doing. If I'm doing things like this, or I'm doing it, I want to be participating. I want, I want right. these group efforts. I want things on Zoom, like we talked about earlier, like new applications of things that we would do in the default world that are as close as possible to how we would have done it in the analog world now. You know. Yeah. So if that makes any sense, that's how I'm trying to kind of focus some of my energies. You had one last particular COVID story that you wanted to uh, tell us about your your adventure. Yes. One of the highlights of, of my COVID pandemic traveling to Austin story is that the, the final meal I the final meal that I had was with my mom. And when I say the final meal, what I mean is is the last meal that I had in a sit down restaurant prepared oh. by other people um, over a month ago was with my mother oh. and we got Tex Mex and you know we got queso and enchiladas oh, and tacos at one of these old spots. In, in the neighborhood I grew up in. And that's that's a wonderful memory. Yeah. And yeah. I'm glad I did that. And I wouldn't, if anything, that whole trip and all of it's kind of like being frustrating and being expensive and being worrisome and being sad and disappointing in a lot of ways, I wouldn't exchange any of that for that experience of knowing that like if the whole world went to shit, like major, big yeah. time, whatever, Tomorrow and, you know, we're living in Terminator land tomorrow or RoboCop or whatever. It's uh, 
I had that experience. That was that was like my final like if I never have a, a meal at a restaurant again, having queso and enchiladas with my mom, you know, in the neighborhood I grew up in was worth going to Austin. Yeah. And I don't see that as happening. Sure. But, but in the context now of, you know, sitting at home having, you know, grilled cheese sandwiches and tomato soup for a month <laughs> <laughs> and and and, yeah. and being, you know, paranoid about other people preparing food for me, yeah. you know, not yeah. wanting that at all. Uh, I'm glad that I'm glad I did that. I'm glad that I glad I had that experience and, you know, I timed it perfectly too, because literally that was the last day that Austin had restaurants open and there's, oh. you know, when you go to Austin, you want to go eat there. Yeah. So if I'd oh, stayed there longer, I'd have been in Austin where I couldn't get enchiladas. That I'd been in Austin torture. I could get a chicken fried steak. And that's, the, yeah, that's torture right yeah. there. No, yeah. Not, be, not able to get any barbecue in Austin or something. That would be. A, yeah. So I'm glad I did that. You know, some people were giving me shit for like having gone to Austin during these times. And it is what it is. I, I, I don't regret it. I'm like, that's why I came back early. That's why I bunkered down in a hotel on the east side. I'm not going to feel guilty for having that meal with my mom. I feel great about it. Yeah. Well, I'm going to put links in the show notes. People can find you at the places. Chris Sanders, thanks so much, man. Thank you, Brendan. 